Your local writer's group is crap. Stop burning off your free time in the presence of introverted do-nothings. Instead, join the Goslings Writers Group live stream and podcast, The Goslings, a digital gang for writers. Writers who actually write stuff, who use typewriters, writers who name their pit bulls Hemingway, writers who write all the people who've ever offended them into their stories, then murder the shit out of them, The Goslings. We don't always act pretentious, but when we do, we wear f***ing ascots. Welcome to the Goslings. Right like a man, he's a typewriter. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Take up the broken sword of your father. And strike down the darkness. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. What is that? You know what? It's bullet. It's regular old bullet. Standard issue bullet. But I've been decanting it in our skull decanter. <laughs> He's been letting it simmer. Yeah. <laughs> so well, hey, everyone. Good. I'm uh, I'm Jonathan. I am Nick. And we are the Goslings. And we are extremely excited today to have uh, the return of the king, man. Yes, I absolutely. Mean, you know, uh, we have been extremely blessed to, um, to get uh, none other than the man himself. The author yes. of the Genesis Six conspiracy, yep. um, Gary Wayne. Yeah, give it up, everybody. Everybody, ladies and the gentlemen, master. the incomparable, the master, Gary, Gary Wayne. Wayne. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> Doing very well, and uh, I'm so happy to be back with you. I'm not sure I can live up to the intro. <laughs> I will humble myself and do my best, uh, but uh, it's becoming a good theme, to be back with you. Know? You. <laughs> you live up to the intro. We're trying to come up with an intro that is suitable and we do we yeah. fall short every time yeah we struggle to find an intro that uh yeah we're kind of like wayne and garth in a lot of ways you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's this is a real it's a real treat to have you uh last time we covered just a whole range of stuff yeah, in your book and this time we st still have a whole range of stuff we're we got a little more again. time with you this time too which we yeah. really appreciate yep and uh, we might actually drill down a little deeper on a couple of things yeah yeah um but first about the book genesis 6 conspiracy actually jonathan had a great opening question oh yeah yeah uh, about the book so you know for people like me and nick um we are we're already pretty deep down the rabbit hole we're already you know super fans of your work and uh, we get it we're there um you know one thing that i have run into with trying to tell people about the genesis 6 conspiracy is um they don't seem to really grasp why it's important even from a christian perspective uh i sometimes think that you know people disregard it um out of uh, condescension because it seems a little fairy tale-ish to them yeah. nick seems to err more on the side that it seems i think they're a little afraid for you gary um why should christians care about the genesis 6 conspiracy mm -hmm. well yeah i think it's a very very good question and i think i would start with maybe a little bit further downstream on the answer and kind of work back and so okay. there's two things that ministers priests churches don't tend to teach and don't teach a lot about if they do for the most part that's prehistory and prophecy and so they're not preparing people for the end time so if we are in the end time and i think we are in the fig tree generation yes i'm not predicting any dates but i think i think we're in that fig tree generation we don't know how long that generation is could be 70 years it could be 120 years could be a generation as described as 40 years and then you need to be able to pick the start date so uh and i think jerusalem may very well be that fig tree sign that starts it mm. so mm. but even if we weren't and even if you weren't sure but you always want to be watching as jesus instructed us yeah then yeah. you have to be able to teach prophecy the difficulty with teaching prophecy is it is as extraordinary um supernatural as is the Genesis 6, 1 through 4 aspect. And what's even more interesting 
fascinating for me is that if you want to understand prophecy in its fullest extent, you have to understand prehistory. Yes. Because so much of the allegory, so much of the context yeah. is there. So if you want to understand mm. who Babylon is, you want to understand who these beings are that are coming out of the abyss in Revelation 9, you, you, yeah. have, to, you have to be able to understand what happened there so you can understand who the beast kingdoms are. Yeah. And so in the churches, they're not teaching this because they're not taught this in seminary schools, either in Catholicism really? or Protestantism. They're not, and they're told not to teach it. So really? I'll actually get lots of ministers coming to me and asking for information. Um, and I always, you know, give it back so that they've got it in the biblical matchups, right? I can give them the other context because they're just not taught that. And it's, yeah. it's quite quite an eye-opener, uh, unfortunately, because they've not been prepared to lead the flock. Mm. Yeah. And they're mm -hmm. not leading the flock. So, so if, if we're in one of the birth pangs today, as in the pandemic, which yeah. is one of the four birth pangs, which you have to understand what that means and uh, how it fits into the end time, we, should, we ought not to be surprised then that we've had no leadership from any of the churches, for the most part, all around mm -hmm. the world. We have some exceptional ministers and priests here and there, but that's the exception. So we ought not mm -hmm. to be surprised at that. So if you want to learn about what affects the world today, you have to learn about prehistory and history. If you want to know how our organizational structures came about, why they're doing what they're doing, what the political agendas are, Yes. You have to learn about where that came from and what their agenda is. And that mm -hmm. begins for, began for me with trying to figure out how do these darn giants in Genesis <laughs> 6, 1 through 4 fit into prophecy and what the heck are they doing in the book? Anyways? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why are they yeah. in there? Yeah. In the first place. Yeah. Yes. Well, it sounds like some, like it, so much of somebody's understanding of prehistory hinges on Genesis 6. Uh, those first four verses, like how they interpret yeah. that colors in what prehistory looks like and consequently how they're how they're going to be able to interpret revelation and in times prophecy. Yeah. Well, and, and what's really interesting is what churchgoers are told about those four verses. They're right. told that the sons of God Righteous are angels. Sons of Seth. Right? They're either <laughs> Sethites or it's the yeah. sons of God in the New Testament, except right. that humans can't create giants. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But then right. they and, and the sons here. and the sons of God in the New Testament <laughs> is a prophecy of the resurrection and a gift from the spirit so that we can be adopted like sons of God, like mm -hmm. angels, because mm -hmm. we have right. human fathers. And there's like 15 verses that go with it that that build that for you. First John, and, now are we the same God? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then they say, well, giant is an exaggeration. Well, you know what? Right. It probably should have been in Genesis 6, 4 translated as Nephilim to be accurate, but the understanding of that word was giant. And yeah. so either way, if you look up the definition for giant, it means a bully, a tyrant, a giant, and a tribe of giants. And these were the men of renown and the mighty ones. So what fits with, with the mm -hmm. definition in the context? And it's yeah. giant. And then people say, well, it's an exaggeration. Well, you're telling me that the Bible's inaccurate now. <laughs> No, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and doesn't the, that, and yeah. doesn't the Greek translation of that? So Nephilim is a Hebrew word, and then the Greek translation of it in the Septuagint is uh, gigantos, uh, which obviously is where we get the word giant. But that word, that Greek word, can also be translated as earthborn. Well, oh. it, yes. Well, that's that's again what they all bring up. And I was in a, in a, in a debate uh, on Thursday, and somebody you know called this the tyranny of the oppression of the word giant on Western civilization <laughs> because he was using that argument. And he's right. The gigantes does mean earthborn, as Interesting. the offspring of Gaia. And Uranus or Kronos, and it was part of the Gigantes mm -hmm. or the he Hecaton Cherries or Carries, depending on how you want to pronounce that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's not the only root word for 
uh, the giants. It's related to Gigantes, and Earthborn is part of it, just as it became an allegory for the human uh, wives as being Earthborn to create the demigods as, as uh, offspring of a god and a human female, as it comes out mm -hmm. of Greek mythology and is what we get out of Genesis right. 6 4. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were earthborn gods. They were the demigods. So there's that part of it. But that's yeah. not the real thing. Gigantes actually um, and giant both go back to the word gigas, as we would say it in English, but it's actually could be a gaiz or yais. Because if you if you have the G that's coming out of in Greek um letters and in pronunciations this is the gamma that looks like a y and followed by an mm. i mm. and or and an e and i think it's just the two letters turns it from a g sound to a y sound so that's why you get gyges or gyes as it's also spelled that were part of these gigantes which was a group of giant monsters with 50 heads and necks mm. and 100 <laughs> mans coming out of their shoulders so these yeah. were monsters and yeah. guy gyges goes back to gigas uh, g-i-g-a-s as we would spell it and mm. that means giant so it's wow. both so people, just as in prophecy, uh, just as in a lot of teachings in the Bible, and just as people who are trying to shatter or argue something because they know people may not look into all of the details, they do not include all of the passages, all of the information. Hmm. They only select uh, yeah. it. And when mm -hmm. people are talking about prehistory and prophecy, <clears throat> and doctrine, you can't leave out the inconvenient passages. <laughs> right. Just yeah, because yeah. they don't fit your preconceived <laughs> thought. Yeah. Yeah. You have yeah, to yeah, put yeah. it all together and it's got to fit. So yeah. does the word go back to Gigantes as Earthborn? Absolutely. But it also is the root, it's rooted in giant, as it was understood. And these were monstrously sized individuals. They were the great heroes. They were the demigods. Mm -hmm. And you get all of that put together out of Hesiod in Theogony. And then mm -hmm. every, all, all the other sort of, not all, but a lot of the other Greek uh, writings feed off of that. You should ask about the, um, related to that, the, the second incursion. Well, yeah, so that's, see, that's such a good answer to that question because so much of what uh, what I've encountered with like friends and family who are Christians, but who just have never been taught this, they all, Gary, they all kind of treat this subject matter as empty calorie material. And it's yeah. like, but it's not, but you don't no, understand. Core. Like, yeah, 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 yeah it's it fundamental. is. It, it is fundamental. Yeah, it's core material. You haven't had the scales removed from your eyes yet. Yep. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I think it actually, of all people, I think I heard um, the late, great, Rob Skiba refer to it as, you know, this is something that people refer to as empty calorie. Um, yeah. One thing we wanted to uh, ask you about um, was uh, we're fans of, of yours. We're fans of Rob's. We're fans of um, Michael Heiser. Um, we were curious, though, uh, there's this swirling debate um, about second incursion. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts upon the second incursion and how it relates to, you know, maybe what Rob's treatment of it was and what Michael's yeah. treatment of it is. Yeah, so if, if when we're talking about um, how giants survived the flood. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. How they show up after the flood. Right. And before we get into that, just let me say that Nephilim, which shows up in Genesis 6-4, in the Hebrew word nephil, uh, I am is the male plural, only shows up two other times after the flood. Really? That's that's in Numbers 13.33. Right. Where it twice calls the Anakim, the, the, the Anak people, the Anakites, as being the children of giants, which is the Hebrew word nephil. That's in the evil part of the report. Yeah. And that was something we have to be aware of so and 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 for me this is what I, i'd like to make people clear on it before we get into uh the how giants survived the flood is that 
All the other times in the Old Testament, other than those three places where the uh, word is giant, except for one, it's in Job where it goes back to Gibor or Gibberim, which is usually a word used to describe the giants, but it doesn't have yeah. to. It can mean strong or it can be mighty. It can mighty describe men. angels. It can describe the strength of God, the mighty ones of, uh, of David. So you right. have to yep. apply it to the proper application again. Is the Hebrew word Arapha, 7497, which means giant, and plural is Raphaim, and Raphaim show up uh, yeah. uh, in Genesis 14 and Genesis 15 as a people. And the word mm. Rapha and Raphaim combined show up 25 times in the Old Testament. So oh, it's wow. used a lot, Yeah. right? But the Anakim were not the Nephilim. The Anakim, as in Deuteronomy 2, is describing them as giants, which goes back to the Hebrew word Rapha and Raphaim, just as all the other, the Avim in there, the Horim, the Emim, mm -hmm. they're all Raphaim. They're all branches of the Raphaim. And the patriarch for the Anakim in Joshua is Arba. And Arba is not in the table of nations. Oh, that's because right. Because only names of people who are of the offspring of Noah are in the table yeah. of nations that give you the 70. So then you get right. nine patriarchs in the Canaanites. Um, you get named uh, three of them, which are Canaan, Heth, and Sidon. The rest are patriarchless. So I yeah. think that the patriarchs are Raphaim. They created human hybrids. These are the taller people that are recorded in Deuteronomy 1 and, hmm. and Numbers 13. Um, that is, are amongst the Anak kings in Numbers 13, 33, and described in Deuteronomy 1, where all the accurate details are confirmed. Yeah. And so you got two separate peoples, and those peoples were including like the Amalekites and uh, the, um, the Amorites and the Canaanites and a few other tribes. These are the taller ones. These are the, from the patriarchless tribes, and the Canaanites would have had their daughters marry. And I'm going to cover this in detail in my book that's going to come out next year. But anyways, I'm, yeah. I'm going down too many rabbit holes here for you. So these, <laughs> that's okay. So, so these were not the – the Anak were not the children of – of uh, the Nephilim. They were actually described as what was being uh, seen by the scouts as three Anakim kings, which were Sheshai, Ahimon, and Talmai, who were the sons of the Anakim. So what yeah. was going on here in number 1333 is, is the terrified 10 scouts didn't want to go in and fight these people that were taller than them, and they're known as the Shazu or the Shamao or the Amao, depending on whether you're coming from sort of an Aryan sort of language or the Egyptians as the Shazu, they were thought to be six to nine feet tall, and the Rephaim were taller. These were the hybrid humans. And they didn't want to go in and fight these monsters, so they wanted to scare people. So they knew the Anakim were like Goliath, which would have been nine feet nine to 11 feet three, uh, 12 feet tall, depending on the cubit, or Og, let's put him at 12 to 14 feet based yeah. on his bed size, yeah. um, as opposed to the hybrids, which were taller, as described in Deuteronomy 1, as opposed to just stronger and mightier, you actually get the word taller as larger um, oh, in Deuteronomy 1, yeah. which confirms the details. But these three were the sons of an act. Yeah. Right. So they embellished it to Nephilim to scare the people. But what it did do was it resonated with the people because they were aware of. It was a cultural reference point for them. Yeah. Who the I Nephilim see. were. Okay. Yeah. And right. that we get from that that the Nephilim were larger than the Raphaim because they were like grasshoppers. Yeah, embellished. As tall as cedar trees. Yeah. And then the cedar trees, which is an embellishment because it's talking about the Amorites, which would have been, you know, 40 to 100 feet tall. Um, right. But that, that's a simile. That was just referencing to the giant trees of the forest, which were the, the cedar trees that were used in all the buildings around the ancient world. So they were saying, they were making a reference that they knew the connotation 
that the Israelites would take from that because they were aware of the antediluvian giants, which were bigger. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get a confirmation of the veracity of Genesis yeah. 6, 4, even though it's used in an evil report or a bad report or an ac inaccurate report, depending on how you want to phrase it. So yeah. if we understand that, what we do know is giants show up after the flood. Right. So then the question was, is how do they? I know it was a long ways right. to get there. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> it was, okay. hopefully it was an interesting tourist route, that, but we got there. Well, um, it, I had never thought of any of that before. That's awesome information. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so, please continue. Yeah. There's, I put it into three buckets of possibilities because we, we're not told how. We're told only in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 that when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and they did so again afterwards. We're not told when afterwards. And you could, it probably means again after wherever they did the creation of the giants because we only know the oath was sworn on Mount Hermon and we're told where they actually created them. Yeah. Um, the sons of God's uh, oath on Mount Hermon. Uh, so there could have been other incursions by more than the 200 as Enoch numbers them afterwards before the flood. But it could also mean, again, after the flood. And what's really interesting about that is that you have parent gods in polytheism and you have mm -hmm. offspring gods. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so mm -hmm. if we're talking about parent god in Greek mythology would be like Kronos and Gaia, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. offspring gods are Zeus. Yeah. Now, the offspring gods are around both before and after the flood. The parent gods aren't. So you go over to the Canaanite pantheon, right. you get the same thing with El, who's yeah. the father of Baal, and the Baalim, who's ruining, you know, reigning from Mount Hermon. So mm -hmm. El's gone, but Baal's yeah. still there. What, so that what sort of tells me is from a from uh, an interesting standpoint, we'll, which will start to fit when we look into three buckets, okay? So just keep that for a frame of mind. So the three buckets are, my least favorite one uh, was, um, and we have to be open to all, because we're yeah. not exactly told how, we're only show that they, that they do, so we don't wanna just write everything off just because I have a favorite of three mm. in the groupings, <laughs> uh, is somehow on the ark. And that is either like in Jewish, in Gnosticism mythology, you have Og or Tubal Cain being a stowaway, or other giants being a stowaway oh, on the right. ark, mm -hmm. right? Or on another ark, like in the Epic of Gilgamesh with that Pishtun, and you get all sorts of mythologies about that. Somehow on the mm -hmm. ark also would include um, <clears throat> some of the wives being giants. Right, that's or the one I having, having that giant. DNA. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard that. And also in Gnosticism, all of them were giants, <laughs> or just the sons were giants. I mean, there's lots of different versions in terms of how they sort of get there. The DNA yeah. item one is interesting, but I'm I, I struggle with the aspect of holding the DNA from the giants if God was preserving the purity of the stock. I have right. a better understanding on the DNA that he would have had included within the wives because we don't get the genealogy of the wives, DNA yeah. that would include the other races so that you would have now why you have four races showing up again after the flood. That would make more sense to me. I'm not sure how you yeah. get both of that yeah. to mix in. but. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we don't know, so that's a possibility, but that's my least favorite. And then people will say that, well, that's because the DNA came out in the Canaanites. But then you've got all this interesting conflicts with the hybrids and the patriarchalist tribes that, you know, mm -hmm. that when you take that back to Hebrew, when it says the families of Canaan, it can mean families, but it can also mean a different kind, a different species. Hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah. So um, now you're really getting into it. The yeah. language doesn't pinpoint it. It <laughs> no, leaves it, it open. Yeah. yeah. So it makes more sense to me that they would take their names from Raphaim names, just as Arba was the father of the Nak. There'd be sort of an etymolo etymological link there, and there is a lot of that. And I go through that in 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 my book, and I didn't deal with that in the first because it was long enough as it is, but I wasn't sure people were kind of ready for some of this stuff. So yeah, anyways, yeah. that's yeah. the possibility. The, uh, the next bucket is, again, somehow fallen angels 
have them survive, whether or not they provide them another ark, whether or not it's on top of a mountain where they protect them, whether they take them off the earth or in the earth, somehow right. they help them. Uh, yeah. Just as yeah. if we have beings that were saved from the, the cash or yeah. let's say the little people or some of the other things in, in sort of the, the mix of the genre of, of, shelter. Yeah, mm -hmm. of different types of mm -hmm. beings that they could have saved them as well. That's yeah. a possibility in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we get arc stories all around the world. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you, you have Gilgamesh who is created after the flood of, along with an Akedon. And Gilgamesh is like six generations. So that's, and he's the son of Lugalbanda. So we get his genealogy. So he's not from before the flood. There may have been a giant named Gilgamesh before the flood, but this is clearly uh, a different one. And you have also in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the story of the flood with Upmatishan and all of his family who were also mm -hmm. like Gilgamesh and Anakedon uh, were two thirds God and one third human. So they are Nephilim. So that's a Nephilim survival mm -hmm. story that comes from polytheism. And mm -hmm. whether or not that's true or not, they see the arc through polytheism. So whether or not it is in, uh, yeah. The Greek mythology with Deucalion and Pyrrha, who are the Greek Noahs, and the and and, and Noah's wife, not a chance, yeah. because <laughs> Deucalion is the son of Prometheus, which is either a Nephilim or a god, because they're named right. as both in Greek mythology. So that makes yeah. Deucalion a Nephilim. Yeah. So it's a it's a Nephilim survival mm -hmm. story again. So that's that's somehow with the help of angels, and then it's second incursion, which is my most favorite one um although i'm open more open to uh, somehow by the fallen angels than i am somehow on the ark uh, really? but second incursion makes more sense to me in terms of being you don't have to sort of get real legalistic with the wording in the bible um, but you could make the case somehow by the fallen angels where they help them because what the wording was is, is that God was only going to kill and destroy everything on the earth that he created except for the eight and those that were on, on the ark. Um, and that that's, hmm. leaves open to the idea that if the angels took yeah. those being somewhere else in the earth or off the earth or some other dimension yep. or whatever, that it still doesn't sort of, you know, um, distort what's written. But mm. what's interesting, though, is, is that God was only wanting to have beings that weren't destroyed, not destroyed, um, that weren't degraded. So that when the whole earth was corrupt, that's the Hebrew word shakath. And that means spoiled, ruined, decayed. That means all of the plants. That means all of the animals and all but for the eight that went on the ark, both spiritually and physically. And hmm. God knew which ones they were and called all the animals to the ark, which makes sense. That would be the best representatives. And kind is that word for species, different yeah. than families, but means species. And, and in the applications is used that way. He would have known the ones that weren't destroyed yeah right and those yeah. were what was safe so why would you have contaminated dna right in the wives interesting yeah. it defeats so, the purpose so second incursion makes the most sense for me that you now have giants that are smaller than the nephilim yeah from what we talked about earlier somehow distinct somehow and why they're called raphaim instead of nephilim and yeah if the parent gods were sent to the abyss for their crimes, as Jude 1, 6, 2 Peter 2, 4, and 1 Peter mm -hmm. seem to indicate, then if there was a second incursion, then those angels, fallen uh, gods after the flood, would also go to the abyss. And that's why the Balim disappear, the mm -hmm. whole oh, pantheon of gods. Yeah. And if you look at it from can I Can I ask you a question hierarchy. about that? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you a question about that? Yep. Because I've been, I've, you know, I, looking back through those verses, I mean, there's, there's a verse in First Peter, there's a verse in Second Peter, of course, there's the verse in Jude, and then the account in Genesis six. God punishes the angels that commit that sin, 
the sons of God. Yeah. He punishes them, sends them to the abyss where they're locked away until the end. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, there's nothing that is explicit in that says he punished those angels right when they committed the sin. Oh. It, uh, in in the Bible, there's nothing that says when he sends them to the abyss. Could they have committed well, this act, second actually, incursion? If you, and then if you look at the if, if you look at First Peter and if you look at Second Peter in those passages, read the passages right after. It's all connected to the time of the flood when they were put into the prisons. You have to read the larger context, okay. right? That's where you get that okay. sort of connection. Okay. And in okay. Jude six. Uh, they left their habitation when they sinned. And habitation yeah. is the mm -hmm. Greek word oikotarian, which means a dwelling mm -hmm. place for the spirit. And so you only get oikotarian twice in the New Testament, once in Jude 1.6 for habitation, and in 2 Corinthians 5.2 for the house, which is oikotarian, that's in heaven. It's a dwelling place for the spirit, just as Jesus promised us, God has many mansions for us in heaven. So at that before before the resurrections happen, you have you have a dwelling place for the spirit, and you have a dwelling place on earth for a spirit as well. And that's part of what we're made up is of is which is the body, the soul, and the spirit. And the spirit comes from heaven that only God and Jesus can um, separate. And so that body and that soul is the oikotarian, the dwelling place for the spirit in the physical world. Not that angels have to have a physical oikotarian. They can be a sp spiritual right. presence, an opalescent presence, but to <clears throat> physically interact in the world, they need to create a body so that yeah. they can talk, drink, whatever. And yeah. it seems that they would be permitted to do that just as with angels in um, the Sodom narrative and visiting with right. Abraham are humans and we get a human in Daniel mm -hmm. and uh, one, yeah. uh, one other place. We get examples of them actually interacting physically, eating, drinking, talking, touching. So they have mm -hmm. the ability to do that. That is not illegal. But to yeah. violate the laws of creation and to have sex to create a counterfeit spirit and an immortal spirit in the physical world in a physical body broke yeah. the laws of creation uh, mm. and all life comes from the spirit of God at God's command, which is the Holy spirit. And that's the sin that you can't commit because nothing can, can, can save you as what is yeah. that we're told in Matthew. And right. so we get those sort of connections in there, but you got to dig a, dig a little bit deeper and, 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 you know, connect all of the passages that, that are connected. And so when you have the parent gods leaving, if you understand that the hierarchy amongst the angels is understood as a hierarchy when you have the word host, which is used in association with stars and angels and the sons of God. Oh, right. Saba yeah. is the Hebrew word for host. And that means an army of angels. Mm-hmm. The angelic and, host. Yes. And within an army, you have a hierarchy. And so mm -hmm. when the parent gods left, the offspring gods stepped up and took yeah. over. And all around the world, you get these offspring, these parent gods dying in polytheism, which they're immortal, they can't die. Right. And that yeah. these offspring gods overthrow them and then they take over. They didn't overthrow them. They just didn't Except create the, the giants yeah. before the flood. They created them after the flood is, I guess, where I'm, where I'm going with that. But these, these angels, these angels that kind of stepped into that, the, the, the parent angels had been punished, and then the yes. flood comes along, and then after the flood, there are still angels. But are these fallen angels specifically that step into that role, or are they not yet fallen? Yes, yes, they are fallen angels because they're the offspring gods, right? Whether or not they were physically made from two angels before or that's just the allegory of sort of the rank and sort of the mythology that sort of gets written into it because everything in polytheism is allegorical you have to dig right. deeper to get to the true meaning yeah. right and they give you the fairy tale story up the top but you have to be an adept to understand everything sort of underneath right. so when you have the angels that go to the abyss not all the angels went to the abyss satan didn't go to the abyss 
True. And yeah. only the ones that were probably created the crimes against humanity and the earth and against the Holy Spirit, they went to the abyss. And we get an example of that even with the demonic spirits, which I think are the Nephilim, because you have um, these spirits permitted to go to sleep and they aren't permitted to go to heaven because they're a counterfeit spirit. And I got to have document on this yeah. just as I do for a second incursion for people and the one on the Oikotarian as well. So if people want that, just get a hold of me. I'll send you those documents. Yeah. Um, so if, but yet we get in Ezekiel 32 with these spirits that are talking to Pharaoh. And this is also a prophecy. It's one of those prophecies that I call the dual prophecy that has important information in prehistory that you need to understand what's going on at the time of the prophet and in the end time. And it's a prophecy for the life of that prophet or shortly thereafter and for the end time with implications and sort of a repeat sort of mechanism. You got these spirits that are talking to the Pharaoh and they're in the cells along the sides of the abyss, separate prisms. Huh than the abyss and they're huh. called the terrible ones who did terrible oh, things on earth and the ones who were slain and weren't permitted to wander weren't permitted to sleep weren't permitted into heaven these are the of the ones the terrible ones that are taken to the abyss and is talking to other terrible ones on earth hmm. in this case Pharaoh, and it's not just terrible ones that are used in Ezekiel, it's in Isaiah, and it's in a number of other hmm. chapters. Terrible. And so books that we never read, you know, yeah, Isaiah, so, Zeke, Ezekiel, we never hear yeah, those in it, church. Everything's important in the detail. We may not in the Bible, we may not recognize it, but it's there for a purpose. So now roll this forward with the demons to the time of Jesus, and he's dealing with right. these evil spirits. Yep. Right? These are the yeah. ones not in the abyss. They're not the terrible yeah. ones. They're just the bodiless spirits Legion. of the demons. And yeah. even if you thought they were angels, that would say not all of the fallen angels were in the abyss. But these are evil spirits. It's not. Yeah. The, 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 the Greek word has nothing to do with yeah. um, angels. That is one of the and most it, frustrating it actually is demons things. is the word. D-A-E-M-O-N-S, yeah. right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. and an evil spirit can be an evil fallen angel or a demon. It's, it's Which even has a neutral be... definition in Greek, you know, yeah. the demon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not all the fallen angels, not all the re rebellious angels were sent to the abyss, only the worst yeah. ones. And then that's yeah. why you have some still around after the flood. And then they would have gone to the abyss. So then after those ones go to the abyss, you, you have other ones that would take over. Because in Psalms 82, you have the council of the gods. That uh, is not the same word for con congregation that's used in Isaiah 14, 12 that God is. It's a different counterfeit council that's hmm. overseen by Satan who wants to be like God, right? Interesting. And oversee his. And they rule over the 70 nations that are talked about in... Deuteronomy 32, the 70 nations that were as counted as the number of sons born to Israel or Jacob in Egypt, the same oh, number yeah. of the 70 uh, sons born to Adam before the flood, yeah. and the 70 patriarchs that we talked about that are missing nine in the Canaanite families in oh, Genesis really? 10 and 1 Chronicles 1. So that's sort of how you kind of knit that all together. It's it blows awesome. my mind how well he has all this mapped out. He I know. Just... Gary, do you do you see all the verses in front of you like uh like Tom Cruise in Minority Report with just the you know all the different <laughs> like I picture yeah. I picture Gary's mind just being like just you know rummaging through, just flicking through all these different, you know, holographic three dimensions. Yeah, movies. and, and you it have to very be very impressive. Yeah. The, uh, well, it's not quite like that, but I do think in pictures and I don't have a photographic memory, but I think that way. And so yeah. you can't get too many of those things floating around because then you're not going to, you're just going to be gibberish. So you have to, <laughs> <laughs> you have right. to kind of try and organize that. And well, that is the beauty. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the Bible and, and studying the Bible for so long that I am just now gaining an appreciation of is you know, once you, it's sort of like that, that philosophical thing of once you understand the way you see it in all things, like it all sort of starts to not mesh or not blend together, but it starts to, you understand the fabric, you yeah. know, and how it's all mm -hmm. interwoven and yeah. so tightly well, put together. And so if you didn't know some of this, you won't know what is coming out of the abyss. Right. 
Yeah. You won't know who. And these, you won't be prepared. You won't be prepared. You won't know who these beings are. Yeah. That are going to be yeah. present, and we're going to be told all sorts of crazy things of who they are. Yeah. As we're moving to world government and and moving to a point where we're rebelling from God and 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 having uh, uh, a day of destiny where they can actually try and fight for their freedom from from right. God again, and you have know, humans go along for the ride. You won't you won't be ready for any of that. Well, and no one's ready for it. Like I'll real quick funny little anecdote i worked in a court office for about a year and a half and um uh, in it was right before covid really hit and um you know there was some alien stuff that was coming out you know the navy was releasing like some you possible know, disclosure, disclosure right yeah you know, there was yeah. all that stuff going on and uh and i used to i mean i believe it but i used to say in the office all the time that like aliens are just demons like, yeah. or they're just fallen like whatever they are they're not extraterrestrial. They're not what we are told they are. There is this, and we would do a lot of, you know, huddles and like inter office meetings, and you could quote something from a book or whatever. Very office space. All, like, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's all TPS <laughs> reports, right? And so, like, but they would say all the time, like, you could quote anything from any religious or philosophical text but the second you mention jesus yeah you are it's cancel it's, culture yep. yeah it's dude. Cancel everybody culture. gets uptight you yeah. know and it's almost like there is this people will not be prepared for it but there is this luciferian kingdom where yeah. anything goes except that one person and it's almost like well that's how you know where there's smoke there's fire mm -hmm. you know well just think of what how people will react when they come out with false evidence saying jesus didn't die on the cross no oh, right. right you know i think one of the biggest problems we're going to have in the next 50 years is uh theosophy uh mm -hmm. christ consciousness you know mm. there is this new age bastardization of christianity Yep. You know, that really teaches like, oh, well, we're all we can all be Christ and we're all, you know, and you can manifest Christianity mm -hmm. or, or Jesus inside it, you know, and it's all just yep. it, it's all new age hogwash. Well, uh, there will be something to that in terms yeah. of the Antichrists. Yeah, because they believe in the Antichrists that are coming as being incarnated. Right. Right. Which, which is something completely different than how the word becomes flesh. Yeah. Where you have the Oikotarian created for the word spirit to come into the world, to interact physically and then to atone for, for the crimes yeah. uh, of the world as the creator of the world at God's behest, at, at his command. Yeah. So it's kind of, if you understand what we're being prepared for with the avatar and the avatara, yeah. There's two components to that. The avatar is the fallen angel. The avatar is the human. So in that incarnation, it goes into an existing human being, not an oikotarian that's being created so different than Jesus. And yeah. it will be a symbiotic relationship that the individual either takes as, as a child or they ask for the help to come in and it will add to the wisdom. Right. So just as yeah. Buddha uh, and they and they talk in, let's say, in Eastern religions as the new new Buddha being an Antichrist or Lord Maitreya, Buddha was an incarnation of Vishnu and Narashima was the incarnation of Shiva, the destroyer God or an Azazel oh, yeah. type of God, a bad mm -hmm. Apollyon. Right. And the reason why that's important is, is because the deception with uh, the Narnia tales with Aslan is a lion god. Well, yeah. Narashima hmm. was a lion man. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. and okay. Aslan was an incarnation, as Jesus would be, on another planet or another universe, is kind of how uh -huh. Lewis sort of portrayed it. So they're preparing right. people for that incarnation, and that yeah. we're going to see Antichrist have that kind of incarnation. Now, we get an example of that in the Bible, believe it or not. Really? Yes, and it happens in the time of Jesus, and it happens in the betrayal of Jesus, that at the point where Judas gets to, you know, having to do mm -hmm. it or not, yep. mm -hmm. Satan enters into him to give him the courage and the strength to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Now, roll that forward to the end time. Okay. Okay. Revelation 13, the Antichrist. Yes. He receives the power from the dragon. 
seraphim mm -hmm. angel, probably Satan, could be Azazel, the one as the one who comes up oh, from the abyss. That's why I kind of make that sort of connection. And hmm. okay. he receives a mortal head wound. Right. So he's going to fake the. He's also going to fake the resurrection because everything that right. Antichrist has to do and all things that the fallen angels do is counterfeit everything about God and the Word of God. Yeah, it's, it's like Spirit. Bizarro right. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bizarro <laughs> Jesus, and he's going to receive the power from the dragon. That sounds to me like there is that incarnation that's going into Antichrist at a certain point that will give him that additional power from the dragon to do right. the things that people will say who is like the beast. Yeah, yeah. And that is uh, that is one of the key signatures of the Antichrist is, you know, the, the mortal head wound, mm -hmm. the infusion, much like Judas, of the draconic power, mm -hmm. you know, the, and... Man, and it, you know what? It makes you, as a Christian, it kind of makes you quake in your boots that, like, man, something like that could happen to Judas. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Keep a one guard the, about one yourself. One of the 12 you know? at the time. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Like, right there with Jesus the Scary. whole time. Like, you know, you never let your guard down, you know? Yep. Whether it's whether it's a metaphor, you know, whether Satan is a metaphor or not, uh, in that particular context of coming into somebody and, you know, uh, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's just, man, you can't let your guard down about, well, you know? The One thing I always try and do to that I think brings clarity um, and it really sort of gets rid of the, the fuzziness. That's why I say it brings that clarity is I try and put everything possible around what Jesus said. And he said a lot. So you can cover off a lot of things and particularly prophecy. You got to put everything around what Jesus said, not vice versa. So now if yeah. you're talking about Satan, is he real or is he not real? You mm -hmm. have in Luke ten eighteen, he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He didn't yeah. see a metaphor. Well, he's a character, <laughs> right? And he's a character in Job. Yeah, you know, I mean, he, yeah. He Look, I wrote a whole seven novel series God. about. So, you know, <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, he is a degraded being to Satan's status. Yeah. And, yeah, and as the leader, and in Isaiah fourteen twelve, where you have this Italian name, Lucifer. Lucifer inserted yeah, you for who, you who walk Hebrew the fiery words stones into the English language in the King James Version Bible, which sounds yeah. very odd when you think about it that way. That word is oh, that's true. Hell, yeah. H e y l e l in in Hebrew. Yeah, it's a name. Yeah, like Michael or Gabriel or yeah. Raphael L, or yep. Uriel or mm -hmm. Isazel. Yeah, <laughs> angelic names and in an e l. And he's yeah. the son of the morning, Hail Al Ben Shakar. Yeah. Mm. Right? Yeah. He's been degraded. And he is a great being before the fall. Right. He is, we know he's the dragon in Revelation 12. So that means he's seraphim that's described in Isaiah 6, which is a serpent faced uh, angelic being with six wings, which is a flying serpent, which is known as a dragon. Yeah. He's a seraphim. We know in, yeah. in Ezekiel 28, he is a cherubim that covers oh, the throne. But he walks yeah. amongst the fiery stones. Cherubim don't do that. That's what the seraphim do. Yeah. Hmm. What are the uh, fiery in front stones, of the altar? by the way? Have, has anybody ever explored what the fiery stones are, Gary? Well, not really. I mean, we know just from the simple words we get, but it was able to take the sins away from Isaiah. Because oh, the seraphim put it to his lips. Okay. So this yeah, has his lips, extraordinary yeah. power as in front really? of the altar of God. So it's a purification kind of... Yeah, and, and the ministers of God, the seraphim angels, that That's also cool. um, control government on earth, work yeah. before, and I'll, I'll come back to this on a couple of points here just as I close off on this. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, so we know that he's cherubim and he's a seraphim by his descriptions, right? But... He is also has nine jewels, which is right. an indication of priesthood. So he's probably, as the seraphim aspect, and as the cherubim in the fiery stones was the high priest that Jesus will take over as part of the Melchizedek order. We also know yeah. Satan was an archangel. We don't know how many titles and names that he had, mm. right. but this was a unique, powerful um, yeah. angel that... Uh, fell. It just sort of adds to how far he fell. Right. And he was, and I don't think he had sex with uh, any of the females. He had his his loyal angels do that, 
uh, at least some of them, because he didn't go to the abyss. Yeah, he doesn't go. Yeah. He doesn't go to yeah. the. Abyss. He didn't commit the same sin yeah. as the yeah. as the Gregory. Yeah, did, as he, the Watchers. He, did, he doesn't mm -hmm. go to the abyss until uh, the end of the last seven years after Armageddon. Right. And then he's yeah. held there for a thousand years. So what's interesting about that is, is okay, it makes sense to leave them there for a thousand years so that you can give them one more chance to uh, deceive the people at the end of the millennium before he goes to the lake of fire, whereas the rest of the angels go to the lake of fire at the end of Armageddon along with false prophet yeah. and antichrist. But does he produce antichrist from his seed? And one of the reasons why he goes to the I, abyss. I mean, I mm. don't know. I'm just saying he didn't go as a sexual crime yeah. okay so kind of interesting in terms of 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 how who the antichrist might actually have a pedigree from but that's just my speculation on that aspect but what isn't my speculation is this understanding of what else the seraphim and in this case the fallen seraphim mm -hmm. how they interacted on the earth and what's really interesting about the seraphim hierarchy even though they're part of that hierarchy um, and, and particularly as, as recorded in um, Enoch as part of the Watchers, right? You have the Ophanim, which are the ones between the wheels. Ophan is the word wheel. I am, oh, yeah. male, plural, right? You have the Cherubim, and you also have the Archon. So they're all the ones who are awake all of the time, which is, you know, yeah. the root word I hear for Watcher um, that we're going to come back to. Um, you have... The seraphim um, who are in charge of not only the religion on the earth which and, and the government, which is why you have all that serpent imagery. These are mm -hmm. the sons of God who procreate with the uh, human females in Genesis 6 is why you have the kings looking like serpents early on and called serpents. And even down the road, Google Akhenaten, you'll see those um, serpentine features on his face, and that's watered down a thousand years after the flood or so. But where I'm going with this is that yeah, we get an example yeah. of, the, of the seraphim as the ones who uh, pertain to government in Daniel 4. And you get the term watcher used four times, which is the um, Hebrew word ayer um, oh, yeah. for watcher. And it's about who's ruling and who God permits to rule. And they're the ones in control of that government aspect, just as watchers are the ones controlling. And I don't care where you look, whether it's Enoch or anywhere outside the book, in terms of all the gory details of the antediluvian epoch, they control the religion and the government all, all around the world. Principalities what's really, and powers. Yeah. And what's really interesting is about that um, contracted word, Sair, was it comes from Ayir as a watcher. And then Sair oh, is the Hebrew word for satir. And it's oh, like yeah. sort of a compound word mm. for, uh, <laughs> and these are devil goat gods, right? These are, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Pan. These are like mm -hmm. uh, Cern, Cernunos, mm. Bacchus. They exist in the wilderness did with Lilith. Did you say Yeah, I did, I did say sir. That's part of the Etruscan pantheon. Cernunos is the same type yeah. of god in... They're yeah, there's a reason why Pantheon. it's called it, yeah. Is that why they named the yeah, of course. particle Shiva. collider? Yeah. And Shiva. Wow. Yeah. And so Azazel is depicted as a degraded seraphim fallen angel. Yeah. As a satyr, a devil goat god. And I think what is being demonstrated is, is that's how fallen angels who didn't go to the abyss yeah. were degraded to. Um, afterwards uh, there's definitely a connection between the watchers and the seraphim yeah. and the satyr and i hear is watcher and you get a lot of words that come from s words like saba and sab that mean hairy just as the satyrs were also very hairy oh, interesting. Yeah. and the other okay. interesting name that comes along with uh, sair or satyr is the name seer s-e-i-r both the mountain and the Horim chief, which is a Raphaim uh, that's yeah. described in Deuteronomy 2 in Genesis 36, that is Seir, who um, is leading the Horim in Edom, whom mm. uh, Eliphaz, who's son of Esau, is going to marry Tina, a Horim female, to create the hybrid branch of Amalekites.
which are different than the Amalekim that are in Genesis 14 because mm, that right. predates Genesis 36. The Amalekim were another uh, aspect of the of the Raphaim or a different kind of giant. And they're listed with the giant nations that the Mesopotamian alliance, who are all giant kings as well, covering that off in my next book as well, right. are warring with the giants in the covenant land. Yeah. I have a question for you about kind of going back to Daniel and some of the prophecies and the, you know, uh, global government, also global religion. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that in one of your chapters in your book, when you're talking about the new Nimrod, one mm -hmm. of the things I want to ask is it, it, I want to explore the connection between Nimrod and yeah. the Bible and the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you said that before the Antichrist, in your book, you say before the Antichrist comes, there will already be a global government and a global religion that yeah. he replaces with his own. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what do you think? My, my question is, what do you think that prerequisite global religion might look like? Like what should be on the lookout well, it's, for? It's Babylon. So yeah. what happens in Revelation uh, 17, the 10 kings uh, hand their power over for one hour to the Antichrist and they destroy Babylon. And Babylon is a city, it said nine times, which is Revelation 14, 17, and 18, nine times as a city. So we know it's a city. It also controls all of the commerce. So it's also a commercial uh, organization. It is also a mystery religion. And I won't go through, I can, I can give you all the different words that describe it as a mystery polytheist religion that are used in the description from being, you know, a harlot to the mystery religion and on yeah. and on and on. Uh, and so it's all of that, right? So that's the religion that comes before. And she controls all of the beast empires. It's part of that organizational hierarchy. And they answer to Babylon. And they are the ones who get are permitted to form the Ten King Empire because of Babylon. So it's that mystical religion that comes first. Yeah. Antichrist will destroy this city and place in Revelation 17 and in Daniel 11 will replace it with a god to worship that none of uh, people's fathers have worshipped before. And this is the the religion of Antichrist and, and the dragon as Revelation 13 talks about. And that happens at the midpoint after the abomination, after he takes the crown. So that's how I sort of come about that sort of quickly in terms of what who that religion is. And that's why when we talk about Babylon, that root word, whether it comes through the Greek, which connects then back to the Hebrew Babel, is mm -hmm. the, the root word for that. And that's why we need to understand prehistory, because it's the religion that Nimrod is re-establishing within 100 years after the flood as an antichrist archetypical figure yeah reign over all of the adamites at that time and he re-implements this religion which is that enochian mysticism yeah from before the flood and <laughs> yeah. i know this is masonic history but what how they say this comes about is is that hermes finds the uh, 36,525 books of Enoch, the evil son of Cain, and the mystical Enochian religion that he starts before um, the mm -hmm. flood. I won't go through all of that history, but he takes that knowledge and that religion knowledge back to Hermes. And that knowledge is used to start building the city, building the tower, right. and they implement yeah. this mystery religion. And so yeah. all of the religions that are part of the beast empires rolling forward are the daughters of Babylon. Right. And that's where mm. that imagery comes back in. So this is that same religion that was part of that organizational structure, whether it was in Egypt, which is a beast empire, one of the seven. And there's two mm -hmm. allegories. Daniel 8 is accurate as well. It's just adding more information and coming from that zeroes in more on Antichrist and the seven empires that you can get out of there with Alexander, the four states that are provided afterwards and then Rome oh, and then right. revive Rome. Right. It's both. They're both. Yeah. Both the seven from the Beast Empires and Daniel 8 are accurate. It just provides you more information. Um, and so you have Egypt is the womb for Israel. It's one of the Beast Empires. You have Babel or Assyria, probably Assyria, but it's rooted in the Babel imagery. And Assyria is the one that brings about the apocalypse and takes the northern tribes into exile who won't 
resurface again until the end time. And you have um, Babylon, uh, which takes Judah into exile. You have Persia, which frees them, the Persian, the Medes. Then you have the Greeks invading Greeks. Yep. Israel yep. again, and you have the Romans invading and then doing the next diaspora. All of the beast religions or all the beast empires that are yeah. listed in prophecy as, as how they interact with Israel and Judah. And you mm. have to have Judah, the southern kingdom, back in the land of the covenant controlling Jerusalem for that 10 king empire to come around because that's a beast empire that is going to interact with Judah and they're going to permit them to do with the covenant in Daniel 9 27 the sacrifice on a wing overspreading an extremity of the temple depending on which translation that you're reading that's talked about in the book of Daniel uh, for the first three and a half years till the abomination and then the Antichrist comes to power at the midpoint, sets up his own new religion, and he's the eighth king beast empire, and he's a beast as well. And, of course, when we're talking about beasts, you have the beast religion, you have the beast mm -hmm. organization, you have the beast empires, and you have the beast Antichrist. And you have to understand all of those work directionally together, but they're nuances of what the beast is. That's interesting. And, yeah, because the number eight, too, you know, in uh, new, biblical numerology, it's the number of completion. Right. It's the number of completion. So he yeah. completes something. Um, I have a question about that. So in Daniel, you know, uh, the fourth kingdom in Daniel's vision, you, know, you talked about, you know, uh, the, uh, the the Assyrians, the Babylonians, oh, excuse me, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks. Then there's that, uh, and, and Romans, so forth. There's that fourth king you mentioned, which is like this coming global government so in that vision there's a piece of there's a piece of that statue that's iron mixed with clay, iron yeah. it's, clay. and it's yep. a divided kingdom yep. my yep. question is who's the iron and who's the clay they won't mix but they're all a part of this kingdom yeah well typically i mean we're talking about metallic uh, the metallic prophecies in daniel 2 and clay is kind of something that generally relates to atomites in the earth as you take uh, right. Adam and Adama the back earth. to the red clay yeah. in terms of its meaning. And I think you have two different types of um, ten mm. kings that might be going on here. Uh, you could have strongmen and you could have bloodline descendants. Or you could have this bloodline descendants that have a lot of human um, bloodlines intermixed so that they don't die of diseases and stuff. And you could have Raphaim or Nephilim that are back in the end time that um, are also part. And also maybe why you have two legs and, and two feet, you, got, uh, you know, maybe five of each. I'm just sort of speculating mm. on that. But what I can't, what I can't overlook is the wording in the King James Version Bible as you get to the, the end. I think it's in... Uh, verse 30 something in it um, but where the seed of these empires will mix their seed with I mean where the yeah the descendants of these empires will mix their seed with human seed yeah we're right back to it aren't we yeah so <laughs> there's a different so there's a relationship here to the Rephaim whether it's descendants or other ones coming back and that iron and clay and so when you look at the antediluvian world, they had the same metallic colors for the ages of the antediluvian world. Mm -hmm. And the iron was at the end of it when the Nephilim or the heroes in Greek mythology uh, had rebelled against the gods and had sort of gone crazy yeah. and turned totally evil. It could be a reference to something like that. Hmm. Yeah. Because the metals that are used in the metallic empires are the same ones that start with the Golden Age, mm -hmm. and then the Silver Age, right. and then the Bronze Age in their allegory, and then the Iron yeah. Age at the end, just before the Flood. Wow. Long before any archaeologist quantified any of that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about the Bible is how it reaffirms, you know, it reaffirms everything that science figures out, you know. 2000 years later yeah you know <laughs> yeah um so uh i'm gonna ask a question and then i have to go 
use a little boys. Yeah, yeah, you So I'm actually going <laughs> to yeah. do something. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give myself Coffee. a surprise. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question, Gary, and then I want you to answer it so that when I can come back, I can listen to this later and actually, you know, I'm going to take my turn answer. later too. Yeah, well, we have a good two hours. We can't sit here and pop. I want to be able to focus on <laughs> yeah. what what Gary's saying. So, so we'll take turns. It's cool. It's a live stream, so it's no this problem. This is such a this is such a cool topic about the Antichrist. Uh, in as far as like inheriting uh or replacing a religion um you know replacing babylon with his own system um if you had to speculate which i know is probably not something you prefer to do but i just kind of want to go out on a limb here if you had to speculate gary what do you think the religion of babylon would be that he would replace and are we seeing any of it now in our present day mm. Good question. Okay, I'm off to the potty. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that if we understand the mystery religion as being the Enochian mysticism, the religion of Nimrod, this is the worship of the pantheon of the fallen gods, mm -hmm. but not of the representative that sits above the council that all answer and report to Satan. Now, if we look at what Daniel might be talking about in this new religion and this new God. So, and, and, and let me sort of back up a step. So when they're talking in polytheism about worshiping the sun God or it's Osiris, or it is, um, you know, any of those gods, those are all an allegory for Satan. Okay. So they okay. worship on the surface and Satan isn't worshiped overtly or, I mean, he isn't worshipped visibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the fallen are. He's, he's just kind of like, but that religion gets to sigh. So that those, those who take mm -hmm. the mark, in Revelation 13, and or who worship Antichrist, and or who worship Satan in those last three and a half years, will go to the lake of fire with the fallen angels and will be will burn there in torment forever. As, as we get that in a couple other passages moving on in uh, into Revelation. And if we go back to Daniel again, in Daniel 11, where it's talking about he will introduce a new God that their fathers didn't know. They weren't worshiping Satan as that visible, physical yeah. God. Uh, they were worshiping the Pantheon. I think that gets washed aside, and they are worshiping Antichrist and Satan visibly and understanding them mm. to be God and the word of God as the counterfeit mm. God and the counterfeit Messiah. So I think that's what they're talking about because it's, if it, it was so interesting to me when it clicked on that, it just didn't say those who are going to go to the lake of fire that took the mark of the beast. It was also, and it's repeated. It's not just the once mm. you get it uh, two or three times in revelations that if you worship Satan and worship or and or worship Antichrist, you're going to the lake of fire. And it's always in there with those who take the mark of the beast. So that's interesting. Yeah, I think that might be what is going to, to be coming out. Because ultimately, Satan in, in, in Isaiah 14 wants to be worshipped like God. He wants to be like yeah. God. And he wants to raise his his thrown into heaven to be like God. And we're going to see a war in heaven in Revelation 12 and Daniel 8 where it's described. And it fails at the midpoint of the last seven years when all the fallen angels and Satan are tossed down to the earth. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so all the angels are going to be there, but it's not going to be Babylon that's worshipped. And in Isaiah 34, 18, you get all of these creatures, and also in Isaiah 13, including satyrs and dragons and these other things mm -hmm. that are dancing. One's at the time of Babylon, and the other one is at the time of Armageddon. And mm -hmm. so I think they're celebrating in those two passages, and you've got like Lilith and the mm. owls and like all of these ah allegories of these fallen angels including satyrs and both i think she they're celebrating the the deception mm -hmm. that they did with the mystery religion and then they're celebrating just before armageddon how many more people that they uh deceived and are going to burn forever in the lake of fire because that's all mm. they have to celebrate and they've only right. had that to celebrate 
since something happened that they didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. And in all of these revenges, whether or not it's Satan um, sponsoring the fall of Adam and Eve through the Nakash in Eden, because mm -hmm. he didn't lose his arms and his legs. <laughs> he didn't, <laughs> right. you know, he didn't, he didn't get punished. It was Nakash, right. so he's working with them, and maybe he avatar them. Maybe he coached them, or maybe he was actually mm -hmm. entering yeah. in to, to help the, the, uh, the Nakash do this. Um, that's the first revenge against human, because they don't want humans to be raised in the future life. They don't want us to judge them for their crimes, and particularly their crimes against humanity. And we yeah. will judge mm -hmm. angels for that, as, as the Bible tells us. And that's they didn't right. want us to be maybe yeah, perhaps we'll judge be angels. raised they perhaps didn't want us to be raised higher than angels because we're going to be adopted as Jesus, as brothers, like right. to be like angels, but raised higher, I think, in that adoption as a brother of Jesus and that yeah. angels will serve those who inherit eternity. So I think when you put that together yeah. is, is they don't want humans to um, be Usurper. higher than them. And, uh, and they've yeah. been trying to destroy the Adamites yeah. ever since. And that was the first yeah. revenge. And the second revenge, as I write in my book, is creating the giants to enslave humankind and prevent mm -hmm. them from um, accomplishing uh, becoming like angels. And so much so that they almost get there, yeah. except for mm -hmm. God saves eight, which is eight why people. it's yeah. important to understand Man. that, right? And then... Yeah. You have all these different revenges after it, whether or not it's trying to destroy Israel all the way through, whether or not mm -hmm. it's trying to have, because they're trying to prevent the Messiah from coming about. That's the end game. Right. right? Israel that was is that Rob Skiba's thing of like the seed yeah. war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Israel is created to present the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah yeah. is there to save humankind somehow, some way. They just don't know quite how. And we know that. Yeah. Because they tried to kill him as a child. They tried to prevent him from being born. Right. And then yeah. Satan tried to get him to, to switch over when he was an adult, just before he heads out on his, right. on his commission. They didn't mm -hmm. anticipate, as Corinthians talks about, the resurrection. And as it says, otherwise they wouldn't have had them yeah. had him crucified. So they didn't anticipate that. So they since thought they that won. point in time... Mm -hmm. Since that point in time, and I think this is when Jesus, while well, still in the grave in First Peter 3, goes down and talks to these evil spirits in the abyss, mm -hmm. in hell, yeah. yep. in Tartarus, yeah. um, that your rebellion is officially over. Yeah. And you yeah. will be going to the lake of fire, as, as the book of Matthew talks about. And yeah. all they can do from that point on is deceive more people. And destroy more people. Yeah. That's all they can do. Their their fate is sealed yeah. with the, with yeah. with the resurrection, and it's just a vengeance game at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, when you see these these imageries of beings in the Psalms, that's, that's projecting Jesus being crucified. You get all of these imageries of these beings that are taunting Jesus on the cross. Yeah. They had no idea. They thought they had won there. They yeah. had not realized they had lost. And those are the beings that aren't in the abyss that were taunting him around. Yeah. And, and so when we have them dancing at the destruction, these beings, satyrs, dragons, owls, this imagery of occult gods in Isaiah 13 at the time of the destruction of Babylon and then Isaiah 34 at the time of Armageddon, that's celebrating destruction that they've been able to reign, even though they can't prevent humans being raised to be higher than them and being the ones who are going to judge them for the, high, mm -hmm. the, the crimes against humanity and the crimes against creation. Yeah. It's got to drive them mad. Yeah. To think that we're going to be elevated higher than that. Well, that was always my conceit with, um, you know, I wrote the Heavenly Realms series, which is all about, you know, the fall of. Lucifer and his transformation into Satan and the wars between the angels and you know all and all of that stuff was like my bread and butter for that fiction series that I wrote. It is fun, you know, it wasn't but but that was the driving point. What that was the original conceit that ultimately turned 
you know, the Lucifer slash Satan character into what he's going to become, which is he and it's in like the first 50 pages of the book. He talks about how, like, we're not going to be subservient to the they don't you know, they don't even look like us, you know, Mm -hmm. and he goes on to this paranoid rant of like, well, we're going to be replaced by him by these humans and that's how he sort of tricks the other angels into deleting whatever it's it's a draw but yeah that aspect of of the of the drama is very real that like they just can't stomach bending the knee to humans mm. because mm. they were here first and they existed in the presence of god and, and the, it's, and it's the idea that thing, they might which, serve us yep. in the in and, right, and be some... judged by us how how dare we and, judge them yep. you know that kind of yeah and and they were created immortal and with right. more knowledge not and given intimate unto death. knowledge of god yeah yeah and humans yeah. uh even adam and eve they were created in the physical world not as a as, as a spiritual being of heaven having mm-hmm. the spirit breathed into them yeah and as we're told in, in genesis 2 but they needed access to the tree of life to have physical immortality in the physical world yeah. And we might have seen a whole different thing play out if Satan had succeeded, but God is Alpha Omega, as is Jesus, and they knew the beginning from the end. So they knew all the different things the angels were going to do before they even <laughs> oh, did right. it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So all, all things were anticipated, <laughs> and that's because God is allowing also things to play out through free choice. Right? right? So yes. immortal yeah. angels had were created without choice as immortal, but they had free choice mm-hmm. to follow God and his laws or not. Yeah. And they chose not to. Yeah. Humankind have very little knowledge and have to choose God on faith for the most part. And yeah. after the fall, we got even less information. And so the only way right. we can choose, get our immortality is to choose God and Jesus through faith with very little knowledge. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to be raised higher is is because that faith is the key. Faith is is absolutely everything that that people will follow God and Jesus on faith with very little knowledge are likely to be loyal ongoing. And And then God's also going to give us new bodies like Jesus. Hang on, Gary. Uh, We love your connection there, buddy, but we're going to get you back here in a minute. I'll let you... Some I love. see you. Still... I can oh, see you. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Okay, you're yeah, back. I, gotcha. I see you. You're good. Yep. All right. Sorry about that. Yep. Okay, we're good. <laughs> no, I did not lose you. All right, take two. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, good. So we're going to be raised higher, but we're going to be given new bodies like Jesus. Like they're good. It's going to be a different body yeah. that is not been seen before. So that this body is yeah. the same physical body that Jesus has right now that Thomas has touches but goes to heaven, which if you were listening to what I said earlier, you need that physical body that's for the physical world, and there's a different one that's for the heavenly yeah. world, but Jesus goes back mm-hmm. with his new body, mm-hmm. and that's, we're going to be raised up like Jesus in that new body, which is something new where you're going to have the ability to go to not only be immortal, but to go back and forth between the different dimensions in heaven with that type of body. So it's going to be something yeah. new and, and different, cool. even though we're going to be like yeah. angels. And um, this is sort of what all things we need to understand is, is what is going on, uh, not only in the past, so that we can put context into what's coming uh, before us, because if Jesus doesn't step in before everything plays out, no flesh would be saved. And that's right. really what the fallen angels are, are, are going to be trying to do when they lead the war against God and deceive people to follow them, uh, led by, by Satan in the last three and a half years. And that that's all they that's all they can do at this mm. point in time. But that we're there, and that's why it's going to take such great patience. Because we can't imagine what's coming. And even the elect will be deceived if that were possible. And it is because Jesus warned that that was going to happen. And we can't imagine all of this. So if I can't even imagine what they're going to be doing, knowing a lot about prehistory, it's going to be that bad, I think. And so if you're not prepared, if the church isn't teaching, if Christians aren't helping each other to get prepared, 
yeah there's going to be so many that mm. are not going to be ready and will not know what to do i think a lot of them will be as daniel talks about um you know be tested in the fire and come yeah. out pure but nobody should want to go through the last <laughs> yeah, <seven right>. years <laughs> no, no. Let me ask you. Let me ask you this question: uh, How close do you feel that we actually are to that end of that, days? That fourth kingdom. Mm. That fourth kingdom. That 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 global empire. Well, if if the I think we're we're reasonably close. Um, I think if you look at what the globalists are trying to do, they're trying to bring it about, right? Yeah. But they're trying right. to bring it about through political measures right now which is going to be impossible to do um yeah. and we're seeing that and they're struggling with that they're going to need that babylon religion which is is going to bring them together and babylon sponsors the seven-year covenant that antichrist is going to have be the one who's sort of unknown and is negotiating that and that sets off that that sort of last seven years but the question was is um well, well before i get back to the question the three biggest stumbling blocks to the end time are world government, universal religion, and somehow having uh, the Jewish people do their sacrifices again on a wing of the temple. Um, that just is, so you need the universal religion to make that wing of the temple happen. And that's also, uh, and also, as I've explained, we need that universal religion to bring about the, uh, the, the ten king um, empire of the end time, and we need the false prophets of Babylon to come along to right. bring this about, and we also need the deification of Jesus to bring this about to deceive mm -hmm. more Christians and to create this right. universal religion where you have this umbrella like organization, and we, we see some of the seeds of that with the World Council of Churches, and in particularly with the mm. Abrahamic covenant. That's opening next year where you got the three temples in there and they're going to recognize shared values. And where, where is this and, happening? You know, what is this? I haven't heard Abu of this. Dhabi. Yeah. Abu Dhabi is really? due to open in April next year. So it came about with the Pope and I uh, can't remember. El Taib is the uh, Sunni uh, Imam and they're going to have a temple there for the Jewish people. I mean, temple or synagogue for the Jewish people, a church there for the Roman Catholics, and then you're going to have a mosque there. And it's to work hmm. together to form a right. world religion. But that's just the monotheism part. So they have to de-deify yeah. Jesus. I would expect there won't be Christian crosses and things like that in, in the churches because that, that's against the Sharia law. So <laughs> in, the UN, right. in the UN in 2020, December passed a law that you can't, um, blasphemy, uh, Islam, including biblical teachings or Christian teachings in particular. So we're starting to see sort of that process that comes about, but you're going to need the false prophets to say, and you see this as part of the science aspect, but not in the true magical pros false prophets of a religion aspect. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're going to see prophets that are going to come out and say, this is what I think, that if the world doesn't convert to the one true religion, mm -hmm. then this disaster is going to happen. And they're going to have oh, a sad amount, and they're going to get progressively mm. worse, so that they drive yeah. everybody together out of fear out of and fear. convert to the one true religion, which will be this yeah. rising Babylon religion. And yeah. in Revelation 2, 9, you get 10 days of tribulation, so more than the seven years, the two tribulations of of the last seven years, the one for the saints, and then in the last three and a half years, the one for the great, for the entire world that we haven't seen since the beginning. Um, but you'll have an additional three days as the covenant is one week a year. You have 10 days mm -hmm. and revelations and the days and everything, they all match up perfectly with, with Daniel. I think there's going to be this tribulation with Babylon coming together and the false prophets and the people turning against the Christians and great horrific things. So that needs to come together. We're starting to see it, but you need that religion to come together. So where are we? Mm -hmm. I think um, from a fig tree and days of Noah prophecy, which is the overarching part of all of the chron chronology of events that Jesus is predicting that comes before. 
in a mm -hmm. set order, with the middle point being the abomination that Daniel, and he references Daniel in that, uh, mm -hmm. at the midpoint when um, Antichrist be, makes himself God in the temple, as 2 Thessalonians 2 4 talks about. Um, you have a key component for that last generation that has to be in place, and that is visible Judah, the southern kingdom, back in the land. Right. And then you have Jesus saying after that, and it's got to be like the days of Noah. And that's just not hmm. from a perspective of violence and godlessness and uh, not expecting the apocalypse of fire this time as it was in the days of Noah, but all of the days yeah. of Noah. As in Daniel 9, or Genesis 9.29 says, as the days of Noah were, 600 years before the flood, 350 years after, Jesus uses the specific words as in the days of Noah. That's from Greek into um, English and then Hebrew into English, um, and it's the same words. And we need to know what happened before the flood and yeah. after the flood. And, and the great technology that they had that I think I talked about in the right. last show that we can't even duplicate yet, but we're starting to get close to that. They could destroy and corrupt the whole world, even the DNA and the genomes of yeah. the animals and of the plants. Oh, they're promoting and, human animal hybrids now mm -hmm. with yeah. CRISPR technology. Well, yeah. it's speaking, so, of, speaking of the technology, um, one of my questions kind of had to do with that because you had, you had Nimrod... Well, I'll go back and forth. Who made himself a mighty man. First of all, you had Herman, where the sons of God came right. down to men. Yeah. And then later on, you had Babel, where you had Nimrod trying to ascend to God. Mm -hmm. And ever since, we yeah. see these repli replicas, mm -hmm. in a way, ziggurats, pyramids, yeah. temples, yep. trying to create this... Thousands you know, of sacrifices. Edifice that's kind of a bridge between God and man. Yeah. And uh, there, you know, there's... A, there's you know, it's speculated that they were portal-like, right? Stargate esque Yeah, kind of like kind of like a Stargate or piercing the Herman dome. Babel. The yeah, possibly you know, technologically driven. Yeah, and even Clearly. you know, even some mounds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, are, are rumored to be that or way. techno magic. I think. Maybe. I think my question is, when the new Nimrod comes around, yeah. can we expect a maybe not a similar shaped structure? But is he going to try to create some sort of bridge, some sort of, yeah. some sort of portal yeah. technology? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So uh, I'll just finish off uh, the question that was asked previously. To me, Jerusalem's the key to the start of the fig tree generation, because mm -hmm. the fig tree was just destroyed in Jerusalem by Jesus. And when you see the fig tree in bloom again, you know, the season is nigh and, it's, and that generation won't pass. So in Jerusalem is essential in the possession of Judah in the end time. Yeah, so I think okay. that if we are in the fig tree generation, that would be starting the counting and whether or not that's 40 years, uh, we're past that, um, 70 years yeah. as a possibility or 120 years from Genesis 6, 3. So oh, when right. we talk yeah. about Babel, mm -hmm. um, we know it as the Hebrew understanding of the word Babel as meaning confusion of the tongues, right? Or the languages were mm -hmm. uh, made after the flood. Mm -hmm. Nimrod stayed in Shinar, which is Sumer, where okay. uh, Babel yeah. was. And he continues in the practices of the mysticism and the religion, the mystery religion of Babel, and he creates the Magi and the development of that Eastern religion from there. And coming out of the descendants of Nimrod staying in Shinar are the uh, Babylonians and the Assyrians, and just as Asher comes from them, and the Akkadians uh, beforehand, mm. right? As you look at uh, the history and the kings that come in Akkad, and Sargon is the king of Akkad, sort yep. of bringing that sort of empire mm -hmm. um, into place. And the Akkadians have a version of the Babel, of uh, Tower of Babel as well. And in that version, Babel doesn't mean confusion of languages. Really? It means hmm. El as in gods, yeah. and Bab as in gateway, like the a gateway portal of, of the God. gods. Yeah. 
Yeah. There it is. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. And so all comes people, together, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. So if if you link in what I was saying earlier from what the polytheists believe is that Nimrod was given this great knowledge by Hermes who found that knowledge before the flood and he used that knowledge to build the city and the tower mm -hmm. that he may have been trying to build a portal into uh, because he was worshiping the pantheon of gods the yeah. and the nephilim and tried to be nephilim like as as a mighty one or a giver right. mm -hmm. and he is worshiping them and building this possible gateway and that may be what he was trying to do was free them in another dimension the gods who went to the abyss the ones that he right. was emulating and, and, and thought so highly of. So there's that connection there. And if you look at Gilgal Raphaim, which is the wheel of the gods mm -hmm. or the wheel of the giants. That's on Hermon, right? Yes, on Mount Hermon at the, okay. at the foot. And it was also one of the most significant worship sites of the early post diluvian world and even went before the flood. It's, it's that old. Really? And... It's in that sort of circular sort of nature. And that, you know, wheel is in Gilgal. There's two words in Hebrew for Gilgal. One is Ophan, as we talked about earlier, and Gilgal. This is the other one. Gilgal is used in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, but only in relations to a specific wheel and not the angels within the wheel, which are the Ophanium in the Bible. Hmm. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is the wheel of the gods. And it was... Uh, would have been in the uh, possession of the Raphaim after the flood and the Ugaritic Raphaim or the Raphaeu who were travelers between the underworld and earth. Not only the gods, but the Raphaeu kings, the demigods after the flood. And Gilga Raphaim has over a hundred domains as in it. And a domain is if you if you google d-o-l-m-e-n um, you're going to see is like a mini stonehenge type of thing it has one big large rock like this and usually two rocks that stand it up okay and they're also known as fairy domains as well and domain okay. means portal so they had like all of these different portals that were in gilgal raphaim one of the most holy sites of the Raphaim in the Mount Hermon area after the flood and a site that was there before the flood because, of course, wow. that's where the fallen angels had sworn their oath atop of Mount Hermon. And so we have to be aware, I think, that there are other dimensions and there are portals in there and that uh, CERN is, is part of that search into dimensions with AI and mm -hmm. quantum computing and maybe for one of the agendas trying to let those beings out of the abyss before the time and also looking for other things as well. But I won't go down that mm. rabbit hole right now. We're just talking about portals and things like that. So bringing this back a little bit more biblically, in the Gog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39, um, this is the same war, if you bear with me, as Joel 1 and 2 as opposed to Joel 3, which is the Armageddon War. And if you bear with me a little bit, these are the same creatures described in Joel 1 and 2 when the day of the Lord is coming, but it doesn't come, and it says that in Joel 3, and they have mighty ones in both of those two wars. And these are the same creatures described in Revelation 9 after the abyss has been opened and the 200 million man war comes about. This is the counterfeit Armageddon that Antichrist hmm. will use to reintroduce an age of peace and safety and I see. Yeah. to present his credentials as, as the Messiah, right? Because Jesus see. comes back for Armageddon. It's going to be such a horrific war. Everybody's yeah. going to think it, it's, the, it's the Armageddon. So within that, understand that in Ezekiel 39, you have these mighty ones again used mm -hmm. a couple of times and that's gibberine and that doesn't say nephilim it doesn't say raphraim but it says mighty ones which is used a lot in reference and it's also the sacrifice of bashan the bulls of bashan are in there hmm. that come into relationship and then you have the travelers the travelers the travel the travelers and that's like from the ghostbusters Hebrew word. <laughs> yeah it goes to the hebrew word a bar and it has a few different meanings, but they would, bar means to cross over. 
Really? And oh, that's in interesting. applications as in Job, it crosses over and has to do with the dead from going from one side to the other side. Oh, yeah. Uh, some okay. English translations might say passengers, but travelers and passengers are the two words. It's still the same Hebrew word, just as the Raphiu, the Raphaim, we're going back yeah. and forth. And in the Uyghur mm. text, you get that all sort of sort of written out. And I know I know Hi Dr. Heiser talks about this as well. And I'm absolutely on, on the same frame that those are uh, likely, it, to me, that is modern day Raphaim. And if you look at Gog and Magog, right yeah and this is after the revelation 9 so whether or not it's the demon spirits that are coming out or the fallen angels and things like these scorpion beings which is another interesting topic but mm -hmm. sort of separate mm -hmm. from the two other groups i was just talking about um you have fallen angels and giants from who you formerly used to possess these demons. So they're going to need bodies, right? Oikitarians, probably clones or something like that to interact oh, yeah. in the physical yeah. world with. And I think the technology that we're developing is also making these sort of biological chimera type military weapons that are being described in Revelation 9. And mm -hmm. so where I'm going mm. with all of this is, is that Gog isn't in the Table of Nations. Magog is, but not Gog. Really? Yeah. Huh. Gog, as you take that back to Hebrew and Greek, is described as um, an, an end-time Antichrist figure, right? Hmm. So he's going to be one of these Antichrists that we we're talking right. about earlier. Now, Gog and Magog were the sons of a god named Iapetus, just as Albion was. And Interesting. In, 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 after, in, in polytheism, they have these giants escaping from Tartarus into Scythia after the flood. Again, I don't think that's what happened, but you have Raphaim showing up after the flood that are also associated with Scythia. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're, and, and wherever they're created, they may have been created in the Middle East, but they they're also have a congregation in Scythia, as the Scythians, as the Aryans, as the Tuatha de Danan, mm. as post-Diluvian yeah. giants, as red hair and blonde haired and mm -hmm. pale skin and red uh, hazel eyes and blue eyes and on, on, on with those types of descriptions that, that they were described on. And so it was typical for giants to take antediluvian names, like Gilgamesh probably had a counterpart. And many of the giants would have, in that heritage, legacy, patronymically, however you want to get there, would take similar names, just as Saul is one of the Horim of the names coming out of Genesis 36 that King Saul takes. This is not an unknown common. So I think... The original names of the sons of Japheth that went into Scythia, into the northwest Turkey area, they didn't weren't named that. I think they had their names changed to Gog and Magog. Well, not to Magog, mm, not yeah. to Gog, because Gog's not in there, but Magog, and and to represent those giants that they were now living amongst with those giants in the Scythia region. And so we need to factor in that not only do we get descendants of the descendants of Japheth and other descendants that are going to be part of this great alliance that are described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But we also get this link to these giants that come out of mm. polytheism. And yeah. so uh, this is uh, Magog, the chief prince of Mesesh and, and uh, you know, Gog of Magog. So this is, this is an interesting thing that I don't think that we should overlook that I think somehow, some way, those giants are going to be, be part of that counterfeit Armageddon. And yeah. that relates back, in case I lost people here, we were talking about the, uh, the travelers and the passengers that go back between the portals that are doing so in this aftermath and wow. this destruction yeah. of, of the Gog War. Yeah, and, inter and what's okay. interesting there is right after that, you get the gathering of Second Exodus, which is Sec an end time event. Second Exodus from? Yeah. 
of, of uh, visible Judah around the world to meet up with uh, the people of Judah who fled at the time of the abomination at the midpoint. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right? And uh, the same with, in the same description that happens in Revelation 12. Okay. where God's going to protect them for three and a half years, and then Satan and Antichrist turn to everybody who, who upholds the, uh, the, the name of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus and God. Ezekiel 37 um, talks about the dry bones. Oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. part of the resurrection process and the resurrection mm. of Israel to come yeah. under judgment. And you have second Exodus then being described after that. Um, in, in the book of Micah, uh, in chapter 2 and chapter 5, you have the one who's going to break the prisoners out. Uh, they're going to be led in exodus by their lord and their king, by seven yeah. shepherds. And this is in mm. the year of the Lord's favor that is talked about by Jesus in Luke. And also in Isaiah 60, 61, where he breaks out all of his prisoners. When Jesus comes, he's coming for rapture. He's coming for second exodus. And yeah. he's coming for Armageddon in the days of, of, of uh, the Son of Man, as Luke talks about, in the days of the visitations, as it's talked about in the Old Testament. And so I know second exodus is a whole other sort of theological of um, interesting pro yeah. prophetic aspect of it but <laughs> never lost even Israel, heard that yeah. i have oh, a degree it, in theology it, and there are and so many passages on never second heard exodus that. it's crazy it's also part wow. of the wow. holy covenant right in deuteronomy he says in you know yeah. because it's going to be we're going to have prophecy and everything filled out through free choice either through blessings or the curses yeah. They violated the covenant, so everything has to happen through the curses, and part of the curses of the covenants will be the dispersion into the peoples, and then in the end time, he'll bring both Israel and Judah back together. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. this makes sense because they have to accept Jesus as their Messiah to be part of the bride. Mm -hmm. right? right? So after they yes. see the Son of the Man, then they're going to mourn for the the one uh, that they pierced like their only son. And so yeah, Judah yeah. and awakened Israel will recognize Jesus as their Messiah, and he takes them back in Exodus in preparation for the supper of the bride just before Armageddon. So that's in the year of the Lord's favor before the year of the Lord's wrath. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. You were talking about uh, the dolmen earlier, and uh, and you were describing the dolmen as um, you know one ver uh, horizontal bar, you know undergirded by two vertical bars. And I thought about it and I drew it. And uh, you know we we're talking about CERN and the the combination of technology and magic. And when you look at the dolmen, it looks like the symbol for pi. Yeah, it's the yep. letter. It's the it's tau, right? No, no, not yep. tau. Is it tau? It's something in or pi. Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's just yep. it's amazing. The multi-dimensional oh, yeah. connections yeah. that go on between that kind of stuff well and 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 you, and you get those three portal images in typical architecture of the masons uh the tripictech i think oh, it's called right. triptych yeah. i think it is is more accurately yeah uh -huh. butchered it the first time but triptych as i recall <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. You see it? yeah the triptychs uh belief, yeah, they're beautiful. And in yeah. their belief, that represents portals, right? And yeah. so people believe that Stonehenge was a portal area as well. So mm -hmm. portals are a big part of the occult. Um, and yeah. I think if we look at where the abyss is, it's in another dimension in the earth. And anytime mm -hmm. you have another dimension, that's going to re require some sort of portal there. It's in different location than where heaven is. Yeah. Uh, and and who knows? Maybe there's portals to get into heaven. I mean, I don't know. I don't get any scripture on that or any research to show that there is. But yeah. um, definitely, there's a possibility that there are portals that are going to be involved. And certainly, yeah. even in the alien mythos, yeah. they come mm -hmm. through and they're, you know, flying saucers through portals in a lot of cases. Right. Well, so, now from another dimension. About... Right, they all talk about how you know they're no longer extraterrestrials. Now people are are edging towards what is probably closer a closer approximation of reality, which is that they are interdimensional. Yeah, interdimensional. I yeah. even in my Heavenly Realms series, I even had uh, I addressed that whole portal thing with there being like this 
other this nether region called the oblivion that you had to like mm -hmm. use certain things to navigate your way through so you could go from the the heavenly realm down to the earthly realm mm -hmm. of creation and if you didn't do it right you get lost in the nether you know and, like <laughs> whatever you know but like but if you do it yeah, right it's a shortcut right yeah and there are you know and you could open up a portal into the yeah. you know go through and you know it's all the same stuff yeah, but... my son plays uh my son plays minecraft now yeah or diablo, diablo and uh diablo in the game and it kind of creeped me out because in the game <laughs> really you can like you can create you can build a block out of obsidian you can build this arch out of obsidian and oh, if you set it on start. fire it turns into a portal and you can go into it and it takes you into <laughs> a nether it's called the nether the nether really yeah and yep. you can and it's yep. and it's like a, it's like the upside down of yeah. the world uh -huh. that you're in well, and right. you can navigate yeah. your way things. to the yeah. place you want to go and avoid yeah. all the bad guys in the other dimension. Yeah, yeah the shortcut, the hyperspace yeah. shortcut. But it's all dark speed. and yeah. like... You know, Babylon like, 5, like actually, inter interestingly so enough, yes. kids game. Babylon, the TV show Babylon 5, which was a really yep. well done show, uh, had a similar thing like that where you had, you had like, I don't remember what they called it, but it's basically hyperspace. But it was always really spooky. It looked like, it looked yep. like hell. It was just Ooh. all yep. red yep. and, you know, anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's um, a bit of a rabbit trail. <laughs> yeah, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, that's fun. You know, so well, that le that leads me and, to something. And, and, I... and, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's unfortunate that the translators um, took you know three different concepts for the most part and created the word hell. Mm. Right, because mm -hmm. uh, right. that makes makes no sense uh, because that's... they're different places, right? You have. Yeah the underworld or yeah. uh, Hades, Tartarus, Hades, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the abyss that's located mm -hmm. within the underworld. Uh, and then you have the lake of fire, which is yeah. a whole separate uh, location and place, maybe in the underworld, but it's a separate. Uh, and they've made it into one meaning. So people aren't right. thinking that uh, Sheol, as the underworld would be called in, in Hebrew, they don't think anything about the underworld is biblical. Right. Yeah. Right? Have you ever seen uh, any of Gary Lar uh, Gary Larson's, uh, Clarence Larkin's um, <laughs> illustrations of uh, his, like, his maps of the underworld? He's the guy, he wrote the Dispensational Truth, but he also wrote uh, a book called The Spirit World, released like 100 years ago. And he sort of actually illustrated all of that. So, a very old book, but, uh, but he got yeah, No, I've not out. read it, but... It, yeah, it'd be interesting to to have a look at that. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Clarence Larkin, uh, our dad, gave me that mm -hmm. book yeah. when I started yeah. writing the angel books. And yeah, it's yeah. Awesome. But the reason the reason why it's been conflated is so that they can allegorize it away. Oh so right, people, yeah. Take it right, away. and you and you see that that hell's a concept. It's not right. a place because mm -hmm. just like Christ is a the lake of fire and Satan is a yeah. concept and. Yeah. You know. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when when you when you take the like a fire back to to Greek, it doesn't say um, hell. It doesn't say Hades. It does, it's it's the lake of fire. It's words for that, right? And um, it's yeah. also interesting Henna. that you know the word hell, you know, is is you know really goes back to hell L, you know, as the god of the pit, the one that he's going down to that Isaiah talks oh, about, right? Yeah, mm. and uh, that's a and you actually you, you actually yeah. get the spelling of uh, H E L or H E Y L as, as you take that back in etymology as being a mm -hmm. place in the underworld. And of course, the E L is the angelic part of of the name, and he's the god of hell, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Wow. Yeah, never thought of that. Uh -huh. So, like, um, you know, we we have this understanding of Hades, kind of a resting place or a holding tank if you will or resting mm. place of the of, of the dead you have hades and you have uh gehenna mm -hmm. or excuse me is it sheol and gehenna i think it's sheol and gehenna and sheol. makes up yeah. hades but is there any now after christ's resurrection is there any use for sheol a place oh, for the righteous right. dead well um i wouldn't say the righteous dead are in that location yeah. So I would say that the underworld is a place for the fallen angels um, that yeah. they were, you know, going back and forth on. It's the location for the prison of the abyss um, and that the dead of the Nephilim 
and the spirits can go back between those portals as well. Um, so I think it's all about um, the location for the dead in the physical world of the, the Nephilim, the Raphaim, and probably a lot of a, a lot of their descendants that kept up with that kind of belief. Um, and reincarnation is all about you know sort of navigating your way through that. This is all demonic spirit beliefs. This has got nothing to do with humans. Humans yeah. sleep. Yeah. You get you get. Uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the Abraham's bosom. Uh, as a parable that Jesus talks about. And he talked about in languages and stories and a parable that mm -hmm. the people of that time understood. So you get the message, but it wasn't the message of the story. It wasn't, didn't have to be real. The message was, is even if somebody came back from the dead, you wouldn't change anyway. So you could send as many people back, you still wouldn't believe, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says over and over and over and over and over, you sleep. And so just as... In Ezekiel 37, Israel will come back to life in their bodies to, to come under the judgment. You also have the, the rising of the dead in the series of the resurrections, Christ, the first fruits. And then when he comes, those who died in Jesus. So you got a diff you got different sets there. You have Christ. The first fruits are those who are martyred in the 2,000 years uh, since Jesus has been here. And they're seen in Revelation 6, and they're told to wait for those who have to be martyred like they were for the testimony of Jesus that come out of the great tribulation. That's the first three and a half years. And then when he mm -hmm. comes, uh, those first fruits were all going to be resurrected first. And that also includes the two witnesses, which are the first three and a half years. It also includes the 144,000 that are shown in Revelation 14. Um, and they're also actually called first fruits. We're not told that they're killed, but they're seen in heaven. And one presumes that they were martyred as first fruits, as all the other fruits are. And then those who died believing in Jesus are resurrected at the same time uh, as those who are still alive, that are the select few that are going to be raptured. And then you have another resurrection that's talked about in Revelation 15 of those who refused the mark and refused to worship Satan and Antichrist in the last three and a half years that are resurrected as part of the summary of the last three and a half years. And that resurrection is for sure happened when you have them seen as reigning in Revelation 20 with Jesus. So you've got that series of, and that's why even through the rapture verses, it's all about the dead who sleep that are resurrected, right? And over and over and over and over throughout the Bible, it says you sleep. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that whole... Uh, place that, that whole idea that uh, the bosom, Abraham bosom, is where you know, like purgatory or places where people to go. That that's polytheism, and yeah. at the time of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and yeah. they were arguing over whether there would be a resurrection, there wouldn't be. What happened when you? They didn't really know. They didn't really get that in their scripture as to what happened, except that they were told whether it's in Proverbs or wherever else in the Old Testament. You sleep. So that when you get into Daniel 12, it says those who sleep, you know, in the dust will be will be resurrected at that time again, right? Some to um, uh, you know, eternity and some for judgment. That's referencing, again, the midpoint of the last seven years. And when Ezekiel 37 happens at the time of the second exodus. Second exodus. Mm-hmm. That is such an interesting topic. It's going to be my third know. book. I'm, that comes it, out. Yeah. Uh, spoken yeah, like I'm, a true writer. After, <laughs> after the yeah. sequel of, of, of uh -huh. yeah, so I got it half written. Um, so. the, the third book is half written? Yeah. I'm finishing off the second book. Uh, 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 I set it aside awesome. for a bit. I'm going to run to the okay. yeah. Yeah, sure. real quick. It's my turn. <laughs> to use the, and I'll be right back and uh, yeah. go on to your next question. Yeah, so I mean I did want to um I know we're we're creeping up on uh 2 hours here so I wanted to make sure that we talked about this before you had to go but we'll take it for as long as we can get you Gary. Uh I wanted to ask you how your second book was coming along and uh any sort of news as far as a release date or yeah. um and anything you well, want to hint at for people? I targeted to have it finished written by the end of the year. I'm still trying to get that done. Right, and cool. I obviously, uh, you know, I have a publisher um, and I'll also be soon, I think, weighing out 
maybe other options, but I'm also quite loyal, so I'll probably stick with my existing publisher because I do want that distribution. Oh, yeah. And so I'm hoping sometime next year, depending on how long, if I can get it done by the end of the year and if um, the process goes through quickly as to slowly. Sometimes it can take six months to a year to get it out. Uh, the publisher I worked with for the first book, he, he tends to get books out in like two months. So really, um, he, wow. yeah, he has a pretty good turnaround time, but I'm, ho so I'm hoping for early next year and, uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, really loving it. It's just, you know, it's, it's a lot of research and a lot of detail. If you thought there was a lot of end notes in, in the, uh, first book, <laughs> there's going to be way more in this one and it's 95% biblical. So, and I'm going to bring in just a little bit of stuff to sort of corroborate and give a little bit more context, but there's just so much that's written in the Bible about giants that people don't know. I mean, there's just tons of stuff and so much about the angels and the hierarchy of the angels and, mm -hmm. you know, the dual prophecies that people have never looked at, like Isaiah 13 and 14 and um, Ezekiel 28 really... and. Oh yeah. I really could have used this book uh, 20 years ago, it sounds like, when I started writing the Heavenly Realm series because, you know, no one ever did any research about that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. the topics that you talk about are stuff that, like, hardly anybody – it truly was. It was like Clarence Larkin, and and that was about it. Everybody, yeah. you know. So. Yeah, and, and that sort of goes to kind of where we started early on in the yeah. show is that um, the churches aren't teaching these they things. Don't. Yeah. When I went to write uh, the third book, Sturm and Drang, which was about the flood and about the Nephilim and the Gregorian, um, it was the third book in the series. I was still in high school. I was compiling notes, much like you, how like you've already, you know, you've written your first one and now you're almost done with your second one. You're halfway done with your third one. I was shotgunning ideas. And I remember uh, I had that Clarence Larkin book. I had learned about the Nephilim and I had mentioned it to my principals uh, in my high school, the principal's wife who taught Bible class. I went to a little Christian <laughs> private school and uh, and she immediately uh, in a very aggressive way hit me with the Sethite theory and how wrong I was to go with the Ugh. Giants theory. And so I, I have firsthand experience of exactly what you're talking about with this like very strident sort of draconian mm -hmm. you know terrestrial mundane approach that has no bearing in uh you know in the biblical narrative and you know no yeah. real evidence to it. but yet it's well, there and, and it's institutionalized well and and if you're whether or not you're doing dialogue on social media or on emails or conversation when you start presenting the information back to them you can just see the cognizant dissonance that is exploding <laughs> yeah. in their head. Yeah. And, and typically they're not quite ready for it, but you've rocked mm -hmm. the world uh, in a mm -hmm. good yeah. way. Uh, yeah. And they probably aren't ready to, to get at it, but that they won't they're forget. They're, they won't yeah. forget that. And they're likely to start doing a little bit more research on it, whether or not they ever tell anybody about it or not. I mean, hopefully they would, and then they would start passing that information on. But That's again, it's we hope for it. Not only, yeah, we, we yeah. have that um, it, Any, I have, I have one last question if we have it. But I know that, like <laughs> Nick, do, it's so funny. Look, Gary, here's my notepad. Here are like my notes, my questions, and I think I maybe yeah. have like a third of them <laughs> answered here. <laughs> Nick's is uh, even worse. So I'll let. Uh, well, I'll let I only Nick. had. Um... I, I only had, uh, I guess, eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had one, two, about 15 questions. Yeah. No, I had one more question about kind of related to Nimrod and then yeah. a final kind of a final follow-up question to kind of everything. But as okay. far as uh, Nimrod goes, we were – there had been rumors – circulating and this might be one of your i think this was your question actually it, originally yeah yeah during the uh the war in iraq it was rumored courtesy of rob yep. yeah he, yep. he mentioned that they may have um uncovered or excavated the remains of nimrod yeah and yeah. uh my kind of question to tag along with that is was there something genetically unique about nimrod that we could expect to see replicated in the antichrist yeah yeah, it's a good question, and it's not just a rumor that actually came out embedded in a release from the uh, State Department 
Um, really? So you, you, you probably Google it and get it. I know. I remember. I remember reading it, and it's just wow. in the very small part right at the end. And it's, I'm not even sure why they released it. Maybe just to get it out, and and uh, <laughs> didn't think anybody would would notice. But uh, yeah, and so there's a, also a thought that they're not really referencing Nimrod, that they might be referencing Gilgamesh, which yes. would be, um, and because some people sort of conflate them together. I think they're they different. Do. I've noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you, if Nimrod has a Sumerian, um, counterpart is Enmer Akar, who was third generation as Nimrod was, and he built a tower of Babel like Nimrod. And I cover that off in, in my book. Um, and, uh, Gilgamesh was sixth generation, um, mm. as opposed to third. So, I, but a lot of people. But so maybe that conflation in, is that they actually found Gilgamesh, but they're calling him Nimrod because they consider him the same thing, or yeah. it is actually mm. Nimrods. And um, but what's interesting about Nimrod then, just to, sort of to go with this, is is that um, Nimrod. We know his father was. Uh, was was Cush. Uh, we get that. Um, and people say, well, we don't know. It says begat. Well, the begat's used for almost every time right. <laughs> they have a son yeah. in the genealogy. So <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. there's enough precedence there that, yeah, and, he, and his name <laughs> is in, yeah, there's, there's, and, <laughs> and his name is in the table of nations, but he yeah. doesn't have any descendants, which oh, is really odd. Yeah. Yeah, that is so, really weird. That's true. Yeah. So we know he's the white man makes you sterile. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he's the offspring, and he's in there, uh, but not in, none of his descendants. And I think that might have something to do with his rebellion at you know, and and his connection to the Raphaim. Um, not that I think that the uh, Septuagint is super accurate, but in Genesis ten, the Septuagint says he actually made his reputation against the giants to become a mighty hunter and warrior before God. Yeah. It's just, and I'm not sure how they get that from the Hebrew, but that's what the Septuagint hmm. says. Real quick aside, um, Gary, do you like the King James Version as far as the translation goes? You know, I think they're all pretty good translations. Uh, okay. I think the King James Version... Um, I use it a lot. I prefer reading I in a modern translation, but I use the King James Version because I can connect into the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, and okay. it has more interesting words in there. I think there's a lot of markers that are in the King James Version Bible, like yeah. unicorn, um, right. like, uh, you know, as one example, or Easter, um or in first timothy yeah. 4 1 where it talks about not abstaining from or abstaining from meats being one of the doctrines of devils and the meat thing is not in any of the other stuff so you, yeah. interesting you know interesting. Anyway, not that it matters but you know yeah so I, I think they put in the, some of the translators put in some of their markers like lucifer oh right you know, yeah be, you yeah. know god of the masons and you have to understand that the elite did the translations and they were all part of Royal Masonic Societies, mm -hmm. and Bacon was the last editor. So I'm not surprised oh. that they would do some things like that. And there's a lot of questionable parts to the trans, some of the words that they chose. But I think overall, it's a good translation, and it doesn't really do much other than to put some markers in there. But that unicorn one is, you know, King James was the unicorn dynasty. Oh, really? Really? Never heard that. Yeah. Yeah, me not. Yeah. And a unicorn is like a horse that would lead the chariot of the gods, of Zeus. No kidding. Hmm. I never and heard this is before. part of the allegory that would be a cherubim. And so when you yeah. look at the coats of arms, you get dragons and you get serpents, you get eagles and you get unicorns, and you're getting all of these beings as part of their genealogies in the coats of arms. <laughs> They're going back to who they say sponsored their divine right to rule, right? As King James did. Yeah, the symbology of yeah of their lineage. There. And James was yeah. uh, James James was Scottish. Oh yeah, he was yes. James the fourth or sixth of Scotland. He became James the first when he took the throne after Elizabeth. Exactly, uh, and and as a Stuart dynasty out of uh, of the unicorn um, dynasty, so they were thought to be the most ennobled of the bloodlines. 
to that point in time, even more mm. noble than the Merovingians. That's how many more scioning of pure bloodlines that went into uh, the unicorn dynasty. And that unicorn um, is, you know, a single horn, right? Yeah. And it is the horn of Daniel 8. He is oh, that horn right. that sprouts up. Right. And King horn. James looked at him as, as himself as either the one who is going to be the Messiah of the world or one of his descendants would be. But there are be many wow. bloodlines. Right. And yeah. he was into the occult. I mean, he was he was a royal mason. He would he was initiated from childhood. So, you yeah. know, when you see pictures of him being um, dubbed in into masonry, that's just symbolic. That's, I mean, he was, yeah. he was an adept before he was an adult and <laughs> so far above. And he wrote books on demonology and stuff. <laughs> wow. Did he really? Wow. Yeah. Two books on it. So, um, anyways, wow. we sort King of. King James of England. The, say, yeah. the one that yes. gives us our uh, King James version. The, yeah. James yeah. the first. Wow. And, yeah. I had no and, idea. and of course, ba and and course Bacon yeah. was the second most powerful person, both in Queen Elizabeth's reign and then over into King James. And so. Um, Isn't there the that theory that he's was... Shakespeare? Bacon? <laughs> well, there's a lot. There's a lot to that. You really? Know, uh, he had. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gary. <laughs> he, well, he was a, he was he was a writer, mm -hmm. um, and he formed two writing societies. One is called the Knights of the Helmet, and I'll tell you the other one in a, in a second. And he was creating these writer societies to create a new language to be the language of the world, to bring about the new Atlantis that he, that, you know, right, he had also Atlantis, written, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where you have, you know, an end time where you have the old organizational structure, where you have the sciences working with the polytheist religion because the seven sacred sciences come, you know, are the basis for the mystical religion. So the, obviously they're going to work together and deny the real God of the universe. And so he's developing this language that is going to be the language that is used through all of these writers and plays that yeah. is going to be used in the King James Version Bible to be the universal language of the world that was King James and England were going to become, you know, the sort of the springboard for world government and English would be this new language to be the Babel religion of, of, of that wow. end time, whenever that would come about. So yeah. the second society was the Spear Shaker Society. Hmm. Spear Shaker. Spear -shaker. And that's yeah, what we should have called and our so it goes goes stream. back back to <laughs> Athena and Apollo in Greek mythology, who are sponsors of the arts, but also who held a uh, a spear that they shook. Interesting, hmm. really. And then we have as part of that writing group Shakespeare. There you go. Yep, there it is, baby. And, yeah. and so. I don't think that he was actually Shakespeare, although he could have been, but I think Shakespeare was his um, front, right? He wrote right. and Shakespeare published them. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, man. That's so cool. So, yeah. This is all got, new to I got, me. I got, I got all new to me. On that if people want it. So, what you're saying I, is, yeah. is this is really hard for me to fit in my brain that William Shakespeare wasn't actually like a person. It was really he Francis been. Bacon through it. May have been, he, but through yeah. the Spear Shaker Society, yeah, he wrote these works and pinned these works as William Shakespeare or someone in yeah. the society. Did. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Which wow. they kind of telegraphed in Shakespeare in Love, as yeah. you know. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I've got a document, a couple of documents on that. If you want it, just let me know. Get a hold of me. I'll send it to you. Oh my um, gosh. Please, please, totally, yes. please email that stuff to us. Yeah, that's so, yeah. that's so, so cool. So I, I think we we're talking about uh, Nimrod originally. Nimrod, I'm sorry. We got into this. But, <laughs> I'm so yeah. sorry. We dovetailed yeah. off three different times, and every one of them was awesome. Well, and so. the, yeah, and the, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but, but think thing. but also think about this though is is that um, with that unicorn, and it's associated with Mount Hermon in mm -hmm. in some Old Testament passages. So they very strategically have used it, and also where. Um, the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh are going to gore the people of the world. And that's also part of an end time prophecy as well. Yeah. Um, but when you look at the, uh, let's trying to think what my train of thought. Oh, the mountain of Mount Hermon has more than one name in the Bible. Really? 
It is Mount Zion, S I O N. Really? And it, yeah. yeah, but it, it, it doesn't go back to the same word as Zion in Jerusalem. It goes back to a word, uh, you know, that's a completely different word. But it's another name for Mount Hermon as Deuteronomy 445 speaks to. And Zion is the French transliteration of Latin Zion, and also the same word that's used in the Priory of Sion, mm -hmm. that everybody likes to dismiss as being the, uh, a, the a organization that, that never existed, except that you get references, and I, I've got a document for references on Priory of Sion and the time of the Templars and afterwards. And yeah. What's interesting is, is that they crown the king of Jerusalem. Um, uh, Baldwin II and Baldwin III in a small priory in the Rock of Zion. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And the king of Jerusalem title is the title that um, was part of the Anjou, de Payon, and de Bouillon sort of families. But they crowned... Baldwin, uh, who, is, who was a uh, bloodline of de Bouillon, uh, same bloodline, same family. And the three families that I just talked about were from the Lorraine region in, in France. And so they crowned him the, the king of Jerusalem for a reason. Because not only did they have Merovingian bloodlines, but the Merovingians also had Benjamite bloodlines, as they said hmm. they had grafted in. Um, and no, so no, so not only bloodlines of King David, but also bloodlines of Jesus and bloodlines of uh, King Saul. So they got them all in there with these Nephilim bloodlines and the Rephaim bloodlines as being scioned in. Another play on words, scion, scion. It's right. part of and the ennobling word. of different bloodlines. So um, they felt that they were the legitimate inheritors of Jerusalem because they had the Benjamite bloodlines, because in the time of the conquest, Joshua gives Jerusalem to the Benjamites. Oh, yeah. Now, that King of Jerusalem title will follow the uh, many different families that are connected to the Anjou bloodline. And so you're going to see that King of Jerusalem title go down all through history. And more recent history, I mean, it went from the Habsburg Lorraine dynasty as it went through there. I have document tracing this for people. And then in our generation, it was held by King um, or Juan, King Juan Carlos of Spain and currently held by Philippe, his son, as the king of Jerusalem, who's the Bourbon family, who inherited that through the intermarriage of the Habsburg Lorraine family. And they believe the King of Jerusalem title is the, is the title that they're going to be accepting by one individual as their rightful inheritance as the crowning of their Messiah in the temple of Jerusalem in the end time that is the Antichrist. Mm, and wow. So there's three different lines of the Anjou family claiming King of Jerusalem title, but that's the most visible one. Um, and uh, I, I've got a couple of series of documents on that, one was about the Lorraine and then one, one as it connects back to the Priory of Sion um, on Mount Hermon, that is likely the Pan Temple. Oh, really? Yeah. Is, that's the, is, is that the one at the base of the mountain near Caesarea yes. Philippi that yeah. Jesus yep. Yep. was in front of? He, yeah, he we're, went there for a reason. The of Hades, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a cave that's called the Gate of Hades there, where you also what the Pan Temple was. Okay. And Pan is is a goat god like Azazel, right? So yeah. at Mount Hermon. And he went there and, and announced to those who rule the earth today through the Council of Gods and the 70 original nations, that we talked about earlier, that he was going to build his church through Peter, the yeah. rock, changed his name. And yeah. he was declaring that and basically saying there is nothing you can do your time's over yeah wow you know what's real quick this is just a total pop culture thing but you know what's really interesting you mentioned peter changing his name the rock you know 
when you and I say this as like a fan from 20 years ago, back when it was, you know, it was like in high school, uh, The Rock, like Dwayne Dr- Johnson, The Rock. <laughs> What's his symbol? If you remember from his WWF days, like remember. before WWE, WWF days, when he was like in the late 90s, when he was super popular. His symbol was the Brahma bull. Really? Yeah. Like, I mean, you talk about like, you know, conflating and, you know, there is this, there is this. The uh, bulls of the Shan. Yeah. Well, there's this, there's this running theme in, uh, in Luciferian ideology of um, stealing, like, you know, thieving of, of taking um, aspects of the Christian narrative, uh, you know, symbols of Christianity throughout the Bible of the Lord and subverting them and recodifying them. Yeah, as they do that. Something, because, you know, I mean, what is it? Uh, Satan cannot create, so he has to, you know, basically counterfeit. Make- counterfeit yeah. he has to bastardize yeah. it in a way and and so you know it's just like what has happened with you know the rainbow with just like what has mm-hmm. happened yep. with so many things you know you have it right there with with a wrestler that i thought was awesome mm-hmm. man it's a real bummer but that's all right <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was so cool <laughs> yeah yeah i haven't really paid attention to his career in the past 10 years but yeah i was a big fan back in 98 let me tell you but no that's it's just i'm sorry that's uh that's interesting yeah. So I'll finish off on off on Nimrod. So he be, yeah, he yeah. became a Gibberim. And yes. uh, you know, and when you take that back to Hebrew, it's like um, you know, breaking of a covenant of some sort, of a mm. uh, of a promise and, and, and a vow. So he and so I, I think that is basically saying that he may have started to act like an Ephilim, and with that technology and knowledge so maybe somehow he did yeah. change his physical nature somehow to become uh, a gibberim or a nephilim like individual and certainly mm-hmm. from the occult bloodlines as i write about in the book is that he and particularly as lawrence gardner talks about that he married into Aryan and Raphaim bloodlines mm. that oh, started okay. the dy- uh, dynasties um, that okay. gilgamesh would have inherited because mm-hmm. Iraq Aruk was part of Nimrod's. I don't think he built the cities. I think he renovated the cities because those were antediluvian cities that I think he renovated. And Aruk, which is Iraq, is the same city of Gilgamesh. So, mm-hmm. yeah, oh, man, man. So awesome, crazy, Dude, Gary. Uh, this has been so much fun, and I mean, I have, I have so many things. Like, I still want to talk about Lilith. Leviathan and how it ties to the Dragon Court, Dogmen, Anubis, the Lion Men of Moab, like, and then topical stuff. We were going to get into, like, I was going to ask you, you know, if you thought, like, you know, COVID was some sort of satanic ritual, or, you know, I was going to ask you about Q, like, you know, just, I mean, there's so <laughs> much stuff, yeah. you know, and then, and then politics. We were talking about, you know, politics before, uh, uh, yeah. before we went live, and, uh, Gary is, um, Gary is a, a wealth of information. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, dude, this has been and the Great Delusion. I wanted to ask you about the Great Delusion too. Like, it just we're gonna have to do it again. Man. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> we're you know, I mean, we'll keep asking questions. Don't get us wrong. Yeah, we're well past we can, the two hour mark. So let me know. let me just ask you one more question before we let you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. What is the most disturbing sign of the times that you've seen over the past decade? Oh yeah, that's yeah, COVID. That's COVID. COVID. Yeah. Because it yeah. is, as you get into the uh, fig tree generation, you get the birth pangs. And those are yeah. earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, and pandemic. And I think these all are contrived because it's the evil forces that are trying to bring about the end time, to bring about their day of destiny to war with God and complete yeah. the rebellion that they think that they can win. And this, you know, we've seen like SARS and other ones but this is the first yeah real significant hit and we need to and we're going to start seeing i think more of these birth pangs working together because if you look at it from a chronological basis is these are the beginning of sorrows and the birth pangs get stronger as they go yeah right and, and they also need to work together and you know, and we're starting to see 
the movement towards that globalization, but it's going to be messy because China and Russia and other places are going to be looking for a bigger role in that group of empires that are going to be there. So you're going to yeah. see probably, I think, Russia make some moves after the Olympics and China make some moves after the Olympics to start continue to expand um, their, 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 yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that probably happens uh, on, you know, Biden's watch. So. Um, these things are going to get stronger. Watch, you know? <laughs> it's going to so it's it's going to get it's going to get worse. And part of the uh, control that Babylon has is her sorceries, right? And that and and that's mm. the Greek word, three words for sorcerer sorceries. It's pharmakia, pharmakus, and pharmakos, yep. uh, and that's mm. the root word for pharmaceuticals. And in the old meaning, it was spells and charms. And these are what we're, she's going to, I think what they're going to do is control the world through healthcare and vaccines and pharmaceutical medications, both legal and illegal. And that's how she deceives, you know, and leads the world astray. So I think that's sort of all connected and that these birth pangs are going to get stronger. So we're going to see these get worse. This is nothing. And that so much so as, as we get closer to the opening of the seals, they're going to become quite strong, and by the first, you know, by the seals opening, you're going to get 25 percent destruction of everything on the earth, mm -hmm. life, planet, animals. But that's still not full measure. The trumpets yeah. are 33 yeah. percent, and then the bowl the would be 100 percent, and no life would be saved, no flesh would be saved unless Jesus shortened those days. Yeah, would happen mm -hmm. a complete destruction of everything on the earth which is basically what the angels want the fallen angels want yeah. so mm. um i think that's what we're starting to see and that's why it's important to understand where we are and yes. how they're using this to, to to bring things about and you know in 2017 they said they were going to bring through the implant system through the healthcare system which would be the, the delivery system mm -hmm. and that um yeah. people would demand it to have health Right. Because they're going to keep hitting us with created viruses, bioweapons, yeah, bioweapons. Yes, uh, whether or not this was purposely released or by accident it doesn't matter. It's a contrived, created virus. It absolutely, and is. just as yeah. the other disasters are going to be, and that this will be done in a digital basis, connected to AI. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. continually medicating you all of the time at the DNA and at even lower right. level through. Um, bots and things like that. So. Which seems like such a blast to manipulate your DNA. It's one of the reasons why so many Christians are anti-vax is because you just yeah. it seems like you're messing with God's code. Yeah, it's the engines of yeah. creation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not against vaccines. I'm, I'm against anything that sends messages at the DNA level that has the yeah. capability to be used for evil. Because right. what we do know is you give government more power Mm -hmm. They will abuse it. They will abuse it. Yep. Yep. Every will sure. abuse it. For yeah, sure. Like a true so libertarian. <laughs> whether or not they've abused it yet yeah. on these mRNA, or whether or not the technology is quite there yet for them, they will use that, and well, that will be the part groundwork. of. They have laid the groundwork. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely mm -hmm. have. Um, Man. Do you um do you if you had to put your mind into the place into the space of the fallen and uh and their agenda how do you this is a question i always come back to in my books and in the writing in the fiction how do you think the fallen think they could win gary is it just hostage they, negotiation with hmm. humanity and creation i mean the fallen don't believe they can win i mean they've been told by jesus when he was still in the grave that it's it's done yeah. um, and i don't think even in the beginning they thought they could defeat god right what they wanted was a realm on their own, just as Lucifer wanted to be like God, yeah. and he wanted a realm like God, and that's yeah. what they th were trying to win, uh, to be away from the oversight of God. So they know they can't win, and they know the fate's been sealed with the resurrection. As we talked about, they knew about the resurrection, they wouldn't have had him crucified. Right. So all they're trying to do now is destruction as many as possible and the whole earth and everybody on it yeah so they're they just trying to, to take down 
as many people as they can with them, mm-hmm. basically at this yeah, point. Misery because loves they them. despise they despise humanity. Yep. Uh, because they were created to, as we talked about earlier, to be raised higher than angels. And mm-hmm. that if they could, I think they initially thought that if they could destroy humankind by humankind not following God, mm-hmm. that that would justify their rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if if nothing else, because that was something that I'd always tried to figure out, you know, do they think they can really win or do they just want to take everybody down with them to prove a point to God? Just out of spite. Yeah. Out of spite. Or do they want to, spite. you know, see God try and change his tune? Or do they want another dimension, another realm where they yeah. can have their independence? And it's, you know, you kind of have to. I don't think they have any hope for that. Yeah. No. That, no that, that's gone. And, yeah. and they just and they deceive the people who follow them because they tell them yeah. you, ha- you can win. And you need to get to a level they're trying to raise humanity to a level of technology and weaponry mm-hmm. to convince humans they could actually take on. Yeah, uh, and and lower Christ to something that is attainable for every human with yeah. the whole New Age theosophy movement. Or just take them out of the picture altogether with the Great Delusion, which we kind of suspect might be aliens and say like well there is no you know the the whole mythology of the that bible was just the aliens it the really aliens is are the aliens. real gods yes. right you know yeah. this yeah the whole that's that's certainly part of it but yeah. what deceives the 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 elect if that were possible is antichrist as the messiah right yeah. Yeah. So all of that is part of the great deception. It's just it's so many different layers of how they're going to deceive the world. And yeah, they're going to totally rewrite history and they're going to allegorize what Jesus was talking about as a, as with the resurrection as just yeah. being an allegory. And he'll they'll say things like and um things like this um that will, you know, strike home with people is that they'll say mm-hmm. Well, you know the the story of Jonah. You you know that's a fable, of course, right? Because nobody could be swallowed by a whale, and yeah, he was in there for right. three days and three nights. And people, oh yeah, 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 it's just oh, probably yeah, sure. a parable or a fable. It's not. Yeah. And then they'll say, well, what do you think about G- what Jesus said when he said the only sign I'm going to give this evil generation when he was here on earth before he was crucified was the sign of Jonah, and that was <laughs> that Jonah was in the whale of the belly three days and three nights. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if that was the sign he was going to give and that was not a real thing, it was just a fable and an allegory. So is the resurrection because that's the yeah. sign. And then you've undermined the whole thing, just like just like theosophy and Christ consciousness removes yep. the personhood. Yeah of of the deity and yeah it just turns it into this into this new age ephemeral kind of thing that you can attain if you're just a good enough person you know mm-hmm. yeah if you Absolutely. just meditate because <laughs> because as, as what they will also teach is is that if you have the dna the gene of isis if you have the mm. bloodlines if you have yeah. that spark of the divine of the counterfeit spirit of the fallen yeah. angels that's what they're trying to collect yeah. so that all of them can vibrate into godhood in the new age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they need the world religion and they need um, world government to bring that about, to bring that harmon- that hegemony, harmonization of, of, of that collective spirit to put all who mm-hmm. deserve. That's, anyways, that's, that's what they're going to be telling people. And that's all part of the same, yeah, yeah. same story that they're going to tell people. Well, I see people, it now. So. I see it all the time. There are so many people who I run into who, you know, who believe that because it it takes out the responsibility of obeying the law and it turns it into this new yep. age sort of just I'm OK, you're OK. You know, we, I don't need to bend the knee to, you know, to Jesus's will because Jesus is just a concept, you know, mm. kind of thing. Mm. I, yeah. And, you know, it just it's tough to fight, you know, and you just. I don't know, you know, but it gets stronger. It gets stronger all the time, and there's there's hope in the end. But yeah, man, it's rough yep. in there sometimes. <laughs> it certainly will be. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, Gary, man, we've loved having you on. Dude, we hope we get another so chance awesome. to talk with you. Yep. Oh, we uh, obviously next year you got another book coming out. Yeah, and, we talked uh, a little bit while you're gone. And uh, we would love to tell anyone watching about that book when it's yeah. time, of course, and would love to yep. throw 
more questions at you and dive deeper into yeah all the, uh, jonathan's got a growing list of questions <laughs> i know yeah it does <laughs> <like> <laughs> you too. i'm sorry Gary. and uh yeah we'd love to talk again sometime <laughs> soon i i i well I hopefully that. i've connected a few dots for people and yeah uh, given a few different things to 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 look at because that's what it's all about is to try and get information out there yeah and to have people start digging into things on their own because that's how we're going to get more word out there as to yeah. how to prepare and how to help other people prepare that's i told awesome. nick he needs to start his own church and like base the whole thing off of you know <laughs> off of genesis <laughs> 6 and just you know just start by teaching people about the nephilim Let's you just know start with the yeah. basics yeah yeah <laughs> Gary, Genesis 6. Man, this is awesome. We loved it. Thank you so much. Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. Is that uh, the best place for people to find you, Gary? Yes. Uh, if you want to uh, get a hold of me and ask for some of the documents or some information or ask me a question on some things we were talking about or something else, yeah, you can contact me on the website at the Genesis 6 with the number 6 conspiracy.com. Yeah. Uh, and there's also a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters on the website. So oh, wow. people can get a good feel for whether or not that's the book for them or not. And I think just going <laughs> through the uh, table of contents is probably going <laughs> to get your interest. <laughs> oh, there's uh, so but much. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. And you can get a signed copy from there for me if you yes. want it there from, from buy from the author. Or you can click over to, to yeah, Amazon way. to get the Kindle edition or okay, cool. to barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com and, and buy it there. And if you wanted to support your local bookstore, it's, uh, the book is distributed by Bookmasters out of Pennsylvania, so they could order the book in for you. We got a great narrator if you ever want the audio book, Gary. That's right. <laughs> lots, <laughs> lots of volunteers, and uh, yeah. nobody gets through it. Nobody. Oh, gets really? It. You know what? And Adam a, Earl would and, do it. Yeah. yeah, there was a, a group that that was doing it last year, and they be, they came under significant spiritual attacks. Um, mm. Then they said they 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 had it done. Now it's lost. It's just disappeared oh. on them. It's gone. <laughs> I'm not surprised, actually. That's something to add to the prayer list, actually. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Adam's uh, Adam's uh, father was a an Anglican, Anglican priest. He's and, our narrator. Yeah. He's, our, he's a narrator, yeah. but he's uh, his his father's an Anglican priest, and on the exorcism team. Yeah. Yes, and uh, yeah, he's team. he's brushed up against some strange things, but he's he is a stalwart believer. Yeah, he is, man. He is yeah. a, a, a true Aslan yeah. in yeah. a lot of ways. We, <laughs> we love Adam. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, it doesn't surprise me though. It, if you come under spiritual attack, like your team of narrators did, uh, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And you know, the devil doesn't care about you until you choose a side, until you become yeah. a threat. When you're on the radar, man. Yeah. That's when it happens. So. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Gary, thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Yep. You have a great night, and we'll be in touch soon, and we'll yeah. do it again. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks, bud. All thanks, right. Bye. Bye -bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Dude, how cool was that? He's the best, man. Man. He's the best. Gosh, that Gary was awesome. Gary Wayne. Yeah. The man. Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Man. And uh, his second book should be out, I think, um, at the beginning of the year, hopefully. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how soon into the year it will be but it's yeah i mean it's slated for yeah uh, early next year at some point so yeah, yeah man it's gonna be good i can't wait yeah it, it just it, he is his interviews are awesome you know he has a ton of interviews on uh, he's very generous uh on youtube and um he's been on some podcasts as well i think he's been on blurry creatures right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah he's been on blurry creatures um yep. and so he's been on a bunch of different stuff but um but his book is uh i wish i truly i wish i'd had this book 20 years ago yeah it would have made my life so much easier <laughs> you know and uh, but he's right like you really can't you know you can't figure out where you're going with as far as like prophecy mm -hmm. unless you understand where you've been which is prehistory and that's the part that no one wants to talk about and the genesis 6 conspiracy goes there it talks mm -hmm. about that stuff and it mm -hmm. it is a sort of an essential tool in the in the kit you know for uh for any modern day believer mm -hmm. you know um it's uh, uh nunya business is watching us nice which is a great What's name that? uh she's <laughs> uh he or she says i missed the entire thing uh, right. uh nunya don't worry we upload this whole thing to rumble yep the goslings on rumble uh we have a podcast on spotify yeah and uh i'll this will be on this whole live stream will be on youtube for 
several days. I'm yeah. going to dice it up into smaller segments organized by topic. Oops, excuse me. So I'll be uploading those as well yeah. on the channel too. So you can, you can catch it, yeah. catch it all there. Uh, Nina. Okay. Hi. All right. Very good. Well, thanks for, uh, we're so glad you were watching. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, I'm going to put all these, we're going to get all these little snippets of Gary Wayne, just diving deep and going down all, all these rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's awesome, man. Gary Wayne is just, yeah. Blows my mind. It yeah. blows my mind. I learned so much. Uh, you know, I have a degree in theology. I've read his book mm -hmm. and you talk to him for five minutes. You're like, yeah, I didn't know that. Wait, yeah. Whoa. You're like, wait, a minute, wait, 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 go, wait, go, go back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he connects the dots big time. Well, he's been doing it for, I mean, the Genesis six conspiracy was a book 30 years in the making, 30 years of research. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and it shows, yeah, it really yeah. shines through. Um, yeah, yeah, Nina, it is. It, it is a fascinating yeah. series of topics. And the thing about Gary is he you will give him one thing and he will chase it to he'll chase that rainbow to the pot of gold. Yeah. Like he'll find, yeah. you know, he'll go all the way with it. And then in the process, he'll also find two or three other things to detail off on, none of which you have ever been taught. Yeah. Like none of which you've ever heard of before. And he can connect you know? them all. And yeah. he connects them all. Yeah, yeah I mean, we amazing. didn't even we didn't even talk about the conspiratorial um, a aspects of uh, of his book in regards to like you know the Masons and mm -hmm. I mean we never really like dove deep into mm -hmm. it. Um, you know the Masons, the Priory of Sion, the the Fairy Kingdom, and mm -hmm. the Dragon Court, and how they're you know they sort of compete with one another. We we talked about that stuff a little bit in his yeah. in the first interview we did. Yeah, and that was about um, a month and a half, two months ago. Where we did a yeah. first interview with Gary Wayne, and we went into some of these topics. This interview was uh, was really cool because a lot of this, uh, a lot of this interview, it was tying into what's going on right now. Yeah, in our world yeah. and in times and what to look for. That's yeah. I mean, this is this has been yeah. really fun. Yeah, it's very prescient material. That's uh, that's the interesting thing about what Gary does, and he's on a mission. You know, he really is a man on a mission, Yeah. Uh, like all righteous men. And just having that message is important and getting that message out there is important. It's almost like I don't want to I don't want to go to a church that believes the Sethite theory in the same way that like I really kind of. And this is a hard one. Like I, I have a hard time finding the church that uh, that refused to do remote uh, remote sermons, mm. you know, because like all the churches did remote. Sermons. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. well, I, I will tell you mine even, you know, and we're watching remotely, but they gather, they have different campuses, Yeah. but mine does not teach the Seth I view. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He said, look, yeah. I'm not going to go too deep down in this, but this is, this is what the text says. Y'all, <laughs> this is what the text says. I'm yeah. like, I like this guy. I actually yeah. wrote my one off about my pastor and what I oh, heard. Did this, he didn't say that this morning. He said something else this morning. And I was like, I'm going to wrap my one off about that. Man, I'll tell you, when um, it's it sent chills down my spine hearing Gary's answer to what is the, you know, the darkest sort of signs. Yeah, of the what's time. the most disturbing sign you've seen? And his in the answer past right off the, without missing a beat, COVID. He didn't even take a breath. No. And you know what? I, I like, I'm with wow. him because I remember how it felt when the first case of COVID hit where we live. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember where I was. I, I mean, just like it September was a school 11th. teacher in Williamson County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And I was I was working a, a gig, a security gig. And I remember they were having trouble um, within within 30 minutes to an hour of the news breaking. Uh, they happened to also at the time be on the lookout. They were going to other stores trying to find bottled water. Mm -hmm. they had, we had an event coming up. They had just happened to run out of or not have enough bottled water. So it's like, oh, yeah, well, we'll just pop down to like whatever Kroger or whatever to get some bottled water. And I remember, but it was at the same time when news broke and they kept saying, we can't find water anywhere. Wow. Within an hour. Yeah. And then toilet paper. Yeah. Within an hour, like to toilet paper and water both had ran out. And we are, we're not like in a metropolitan area, but we are in a, you know, very developed, very stable. You yeah, know, yeah. Suburban sort of, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you can you know throw a rock and hit three grocery stores. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Know, and a Walmart. No, it's <laughs> just you know. So, anyways, but yeah, yeah. I remember just having a sick feeling. Yeah, like I that. remember that too. You know, ominous. Just like, yeah, very ominous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. word for it. It was extremely ominous. Mm -hmm. So, well, you want to do one-offs? Yeah, let's do one-offs. One-offs and yeah. wrap it up. 
Yep. Let's see. All right. Typewriter one-offs. Glad you're here, Nina. Yeah. Thank you for watching. And uh, this is a part of, uh, we do this at the end of every live stream. We are technically a writer's group. We yeah. interview authors. That's what we do. We find yeah. authors that have the most interesting topics, content, or just have a unique, something unique about them. Yeah. And uh, we finish the writer's group off by, of course, reading something we wrote, a one-page something that had to be written on a typewriter. Yes. Every week. Every week. You can't call yourself a writer if you don't write. Yep. Yep, you got to bring something to the table. <laughs> Let's see who goes first. Uh, all right, and we settle this with rock, paper, scissor for the Spotify crowd. So. All right, here we go. All right, one, two, three, shoot. Man. Ah, got him. One off the bat. Man, got him. You know? It's been like three weeks. I've been losing for been, three weeks. Well, I've been making him work for it, you know. <laughs> Not this time, apparently. All right. Just, you know, now who's the, you know, I thought I could win by playing the rock, but, you know. <laughs> you went with the rock. Yeah. Whoops. I went with the Brahma Bull. <laughs> So, all right, here we go. I see the tired, listless eyes of my brothers. I see the heavy lids under heavy brows and sluggish gates. I feel the bone-weary breath and sighs that come from souls. I hear the passionless speech guarded by fearful pragmatism. I see our hobbies and passions receding into the background of culture and civilization. The age of men is over. Our ancestors did their job too well. This world is too soft, too safe. Those who scheme and slither in the frameworks of civilization have undermined us and handed the keys over to the fairer sex. The age of Aquarius is upon us. A new age, a feminine divine, a devil's playground. Where have the warriors gone? Picked off one by one in service to a bureaucratic empire of police and lawyers. No one will rush to your aid should you stand against the cuck enforcers sent by feckless simps, cross-dressing devils, and shekel-counting demon spawn. The RK theory is here, and even those once proud noble Ks will turn on their own if one of them stands up to the Luciferian powers that be. There is no job for men anymore. There is no war, no frontier, no enemy except our own dwindling masculinity and our own displacement. Mm. We have no ambition, no gusto, no verve. It has been stolen from us, leached off of us, and utterly thieved. The age of women is upon us. An Aquarian age. A new age. An age of compassionate values that will extend as long as there are resources to feed it. And in a hundred years, when the age has fallen to strife and chaos and bloodshed, the men will have to rise anew, to breathe fire once again and reshape the world, to build fortresses from skulls and water our crops with our neighbor's blood. Your value as a man is directly proportional to your ability to do violence in civilization. Literally everything else is secondary to this. Do you disagree? Ask yourself, who is whispering in your ear? Who is disagreeing? And what part of civilization is driven by Logos? The age of men is over. Mm. Nice. Nice. Oh, thank you, sir. The age of men. Yeah. That needs to be chiseled into a block of marble. <laughs> into a stone somewhere a, 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 some giant you know i had it on a couple monument. of plaques and i was coming down the hill with it <laughs> i got these 15 that's awesome these 10 commandments you know, <laughs> uh, you know maybe i will maybe i will have it carved yeah. into a into a etch you know etched yeah, into a, that's good. A, a, a pillar if you will you know <laughs> Yeah. All right, here's mine. Here's mine. And and just for anyone watching, Jonathan's been writing for like basically two decades, and I've been writing for like not that. Yeah. <laughs> so and yet mine's a little rudimentary. Right. Okay, whatever. And and yet if you look at the numbers of who sells more copies of their books on Amazon, me. I don't I, I don't it's know. not me. I write kids' buddy, books. So. I write kids' books. Right. Well, you know. Hello. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> right. What you know, baby. Come yeah, on. that's exactly right. When you have a fourth grade vocabulary, 
it you know <laughs> yeah well at least you don't have the pretense of you know writing for adults so you know i use the words stupid and dude <laughs> in my book so it's funny i was actually editing the sixth angel novel uh, a couple days ago it's one of like the rare opportunities i've had to do any editing by the way adam if you watch this later on my dog by the way i have added (laughs) the reason why adam hasn't received my book yet for editing is uh he not only is adam burl our narrator but he's also my editor i think he may have done an editing job for you i can't remember he he edits a little bit he's very good at his editing uh as well as his narration but i've been speeding through my book to try and get it to him so he can narrate it Mm -hmm. And uh, I was supposed to have it done by Halloween, like the first draft, so I could go through and, you know, have it done for him by Thanksgiving. And I am two thirds of the way through. But Adam, if you're watching this later, I know he's asleep right now. um, (laughs) I have added 60 pages, like I've added like probably eight chapters. So like, it's okay. Like, I haven't forgotten, you know, we're behind, but there's good reason for it. So in uh, watchers talk, ask, what are your books called? Oh yeah. Um, it's called the heavenly realm series. This um, one right there. The heavenly realms, the hardcover. Yeah. Imperium right. falling. Yeah, let me take my head yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, we'll just get all things here. Uh, let's see. So, um, watchers, um, this is, uh, one of my books, uh, this is called Empyrean Falling, and um, it's uh, it's the first in a seven novel series on the wars with the angels, um, the fall of Lucifer um, in the wars with uh, with his two brothers, Michael and Gabriel. It's a it's, five book series, right? It's a seven book, series, seven book series, and five of them have been published so far. I wrote them all for about 20 years, and um, they're just they're fiction. They're Christian epic fantasy war fiction but that's kind of a mouthful so we just call it like epic fantasy yeah. you know or christian fantasy but uh it's kind of like lord of the rings mixed with uh i think you described it as 300 meets the book of revelation y- yeah sort of. well i i described it as gettysburg meets the the book of <laughs> yeah, revelation that's probably more accurate yeah, yeah it's yeah. awesome so if yeah. you're like a fan of you know if you Paradise like military Lost, fiction yeah, yeah yeah if you like gates of fire if you like 300 or gettysburg you know or, or rome total war or any of that stuff then you know, and it's not like it's biblically accurate, but also it doesn't uh, it it explores the spaces that the Bible doesn't talk about. If yeah. that makes sense, yeah, yeah. You know, so I had without to, violating them, without violating. Right. So I had to come up with a lot of creative license. Anyways, uh, it's in a bunch of different forms on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And you can find it. And then Nick's series is called the Timepiece, yeah, or the Traveler's League. Traveler's League. And the Timepiece is the first book, and it's uh, middle grade fiction like Harry Potter. Yeah, eight, eight to twelve. Yeah, eight yeah, to twelve, and it's yep. really fun. Watchers, if if you have kids, or if you're just into like that kind of age group, you know, fun reading. This is like Harry Potter meets the Boy Scouts. Yeah, kind of. It's kinda. really cool. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is this is really fun. This isn't supernatural, although Nick did write a really cool book, Watchers, that you would probably enjoy called uh, Henry Half Moon. Yeah. And um, and, and that's got Simyaza in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Henry Half Moon has uh, the Fallen. It's got some uh, angels. Stuff in yeah, it, it's so. got got a lot of occult stuff in it. Yeah, we'd be interested to yeah. see what you have to say about all yeah. that stuff. Watchers, yeah. it'd be fun. Yeah, uh, Watchers uh, interviewed Gary Wayne once, by the way. Or oh, at least really? Once. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, awesome. So, Watchers, is very great. cool. Very Anyways. cool. Okay, small detour. We appreciate that. Uh, yeah, by the I'm way. glad you decided yeah. to. I, watch this This is really cool thanks for thanks for joining in big time Um, nick's gonna do his one-off now because he we all have to pee again and (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) we took turns earlier (laughs) yeah we did uh poor gary couldn't take turns with anyone i know he He sat there for like two plus hours he (laughs) was ready to pop dude yeah poor guy i know what a trooper we just got one more question he's like (laughs) okay okay he's like i got no one to sub for (laughs) no Uh, all right uh here's mine briefly Let me warm up my radio voice. <clears throat> Sounds awful. <laughs> I'm proud of my pastor. His name is Phil. And today, I heard Phil say something that gave me a little bit of hope. I will tell you what he said, but first I'd like to acknowledge that I normally bemoan some of the things I hear coming from Christian pastors in our country. It's no secret that I am rather big-mouthed about my disgust was with feckless clergy who failed to admonish political miscreants and are too scared of cancel culture to spur their laity to take action on behalf of their country or communities. Until this morning, 
I was convinced my suspicions were valid, that the church has abandoned America. Then along comes Pastor Phil, <laughs> and he delivers the clearest and best laid out case I've ever heard about why American Christians should be politically active. Really? <laughs> yeah. Brave granted, man. granted, he said some things I disagreed with, and some of his examples were poorly chosen. But his call for us to take action beyond just praying for our elected leaders was as bold and striking as a fully decorated Christmas tree blazing in the middle of a Siberian forest. <laughs> Until this morning, I've never heard a pastor look his congregation in the eye and tell them that they need to be running for offices at, level, at all levels of government. And that it is our Christian duty to hold our politicians accountable publicly. Granted, he didn't tell us how to hold them accountable. He just said that we must do it. I think I understand why. It would be a poor judgment and timing for a pastor to call his church members to protest or counter-protest right before the horde of ungodly anarchists began burning cities down in response to the Rittenhouse verdict we can hmm. expect coming this week. Yeah. If someone were to get injured, it would be easy to shut down a church or a pastor who encouraged involvement against the protesters. I understand. I think we all do. And I don't expect a pastor to give us all the answers all at once. But it was nice to see a bold man, a real man, take a stand for his country, my country, and pin the responsibility, the duty, to protect religious liberty on the Christian. Yeah. I will leave you with what he said, a rhetorical question that I hope you carry with you all week as you watch closely the events unfold in response to the pandemic and the socialist takeover of our country. He asked, if Christians won't stand up to protect religious liberty, who will? Yeah, man. Pastor yeah. Phil. Pastor Phil. Yeah, man. Pastor I Phil, was like, baby. Yeah, this was great. Like wow. I, we watched the first half of it, yeah. and I was like, ah, "It's another one of these sermons." Yeah, you know, I hear this. We've heard from all the pastors. They're going to say, "You know, we're just like the early church. We just need to not be political and not take sides." And he started that, yeah. and then he flipped the whole thing on his head and, and basically said, "The early ch America is an anomaly in history, yeah. and the church in America has an opportunity." We yes, we are like the early church, but we also have because of this opportunity where we get to choose our leaders. Yeah, that means something. Uh, that yeah. requires something of us. Yeah, if we let require. this opportunity collapse, yeah, you know we've we we've not done our role. As well, Christians. and you know the sad thing is, and he's absolutely right. You know we have a responsibility. Um, the real trouble that we're kind of in now is if you pay attention to what happened last year, we have had that ability taken from us. Mm -hmm. And so the responsibility has shifted to a very murky place of like, you now exist in a place where you really sometimes are allowed to pick your leaders and Sometimes you're not, even mm -hmm. though you're ostensibly always allowed to pick your mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. But if uh, the numbers don't add up the right way, then mm -hmm. just, yeah, you know. Well, I'll tell you, the, you know, the interesting thing about, um, and I didn't even know this. I didn't know this. I've been, I've been uh, a part of this church. We've been watching online, meeting with a family in a home, watching the sermons, and we're connected to the church. Uh, we've been doing that for over a year, and I didn't know this till this morning, last year. His, he and his church sued their county because they weren't allowed to congregate. Yeah. And then people were allowed to go to restaurants and bars. Right. But they still couldn't congregate in church. Yeah. So he sued the county and won. <laughs> Dude, I'm so proud. I'm so over that. That's you know, so it's so awesome. cool. And all these pastors <laughs> came out of him. all these pastors came out of the woodwork and uh -huh. said, "Thank you. We can meet again." And uh, mosques, synagogues, yeah. Yeah. like 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 rabbis and 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 imams, contacted him and said, oh, "Thank yeah. you. We haven't been able to meet until this until this case went through." 
you know what what i would say if i were in his shoes would be like where were you guys like yeah. why why was why did it have to be me yeah you know i don't know i mean it's a pretty big it's probably one of the bigger churches in the area oh is that okay. and you know when he first did it like everyone thought it was like their church was just trying to get money and yada 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 he, they didn't get a dime just they really? just enough to cover their court costs that's it yeah you know but um well because it's not about it's not well, about I, the money it's about sending a message <laughs> yeah you know? right I mean, I mean but it right. really is it's yeah. about the principle yeah you know it, yeah. it's not about the church one of the biggest temptations the root of or the love of money is the root of all evil and mm -hmm. churches are no exception to that and so anytime a church does something where it loses money or it doesn't make any money mm -hmm. is you like there's God's probably there. Yeah. Well, you know, know and I think that decision, I think I think one reason why others may not have done it because they didn't have the resources to do it. That's fair. Yeah, you know, that's fair. Um, yeah. And and they wanted to do it or maybe they didn't know what to do. They didn't maybe they didn't think they could do it. Possibly, you know, yeah. but yeah. all that said, he did it. Yeah. Good. And for him, I had man. no idea. And I was like, oh, yeah, this guy's my pastor. <laughs> That's I like this, this guy. Yeah, and he used cool, to be huh? a, he used to be a SWAT team cop. Oh, okay. Interesting. He did that for a long time. And now yeah. he's like, now he does this. Now he's a full time pastor. I would love to hear what he has to say about uh, about enforcement of uh, of all the the jab measures and everything. Yeah, he's he. W I would too. Yeah, you won't hear anything like that from the from the platform. No, probably not. maybe from the podcast though. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can get him and get him to change his name. Yeah, or just have him put on, on like a mask or something. Yeah. Yeah. In a bout of irony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Anyways. Uh Watchers uh Watchers Talk said uh that was great in reference oh, to Oh, thank you. Yeah, he really enjoyed it. Dude, yeah, thank you. So, I appreciate hey, it. Yeah, Watchers uh Watchers Talk was kind of interested in uh maybe us having a chat at some point. Oh uh, man, that'd be great. Discussion. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. So, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Man, we had a lot of really great people, um, yeah, you know, watching and yeah, we and, got and, Nina, we got Adam, yeah, you know, yeah, we got watchers, yeah, yeah it was fun, really yeah. great, really great, it's awesome. So we hope you guys enjoyed Gary Wayne number, uh, yeah, part Gary two, Wayne, part two, man. yeah, and then uh, next week we're gonna have Hunting Buddy with us. He's gonna oh, yeah. be hopefully he'll be here in the in the studio with us. Yeah, I think so. The only thing that might subvert that is I actually might get Hunting Buddy and Ginger Patriot linked up that day to go hunting. Oh, okay. Yeah, on the on the property. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Interesting. I, okay. Maybe I don't know. I got to okay. check a voicemail that he left for. Okay. Me okay. Right as we started this, it'd and, be uh, good to have Ginger Patriot back too. Yeah, yeah. He was a lot of fun. We we had a good time. Yeah, yesterday. yeah. So, all right. Well, let me know, and then we got we got all kinds of stuff lined up. We got yeah more guests lining up for the rest of the year, and we're, we're gonna have next uh, year. John Anderson hopefully on uh, yes. for the weekend after Thanksgiving. Price of Salvation. Yeah, the Price of Salvation. Um, amazing book. We uh, we finally had to. Um, we finally got our signed copies in and uh, I'm going to be reading that next yep. uh, now that I have a little bit of time and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have him on in a couple weeks again. So, uh, and John Anderson is awesome. He's uh, he's one of those great Christian authors, young guy, guy, you yeah. know, uh, fascinating to talk to. Um, so yeah, man. Yeah. We, we don't really have a lot planned for, we got a couple things tentatively planned for November without any sort of hard dates, but, uh, or December, December. Yeah, yeah. For December. Um, but uh but it's gonna be fun we're gonna have a brother come on talk about the law i was oh, talking about him yeah. the other day really talk to him yeah that's gonna be fun. Yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah oh yeah oh benji criminal law and some of the things that are going on and his understanding of it as he oh, buckles beach. down on the taking the bar yeah <laughs> good for him <laughs> yeah it's gonna be good points for tenacity so. yes all right well we both have to pee and uh we have to get nachos before they close oh yeah we so. gotta get over there you gotta go <laughs> so, harass some waitresses that's right yeah yeah or just get a euro i don't know yeah whatever. we could do that too yeah, who, cares? <laughs> who cares all right guys it's good to talk uh, good to see everybody yeah, we'll see you next you. week same time 4 30 central standard time on yeah. the gosling's youtube channel yep and uh i think that's it right yep i'm jonathan i'm nick we're the goslings we will see you later we'll see you later guys have a good one